אשר לזיווג הגון לחבי בן מזל, לעילוי נשמת נתן בן רחל, לרפואה עוף דוד בן חווה, רפואה שלמה, לעילוי נשמת חיה בת אברהם, שמואל צבי בן בנימין, נוח רפאל בן יוסף חיים, אלימלך בן מרדכי, הן אוסו לשידוך שירה בת שרה, ברכה בת שרה, שידוך הגון במהרה, לרפואת אדליה חגילו בת רחל ואברהם בן טובה, הן אוסו לרפואת דבורה דורה ראיה בת חנה. One announcement before we start is uh, we have a seminar, in, uh, seminar weekend in uh, Florida, in Miami. Uh, I would like to give this announcement. It will be from the 15th until the 17th of December, from Friday to Sunday. Ramada Hotel, Marco Polo, Miami. It's a subsidized price, very, very low price. And the number to call, a lot of people ask me, I just figure I will announce it. The number to call is 718-938-1679. 718-938-1679. Please hurry up before there will be no room left. Some of the, two of the best speakers in Israel are coming. It's going to be a good combination, Hebrew and English. I know that some people come from New York, some from Arizona, all the way to Florida. Needless to say, those who are in Florida should take advantage on the once, once on the who knows how long. It's, we don't usually have that many opportunities to make a seminar, once every few years. Tov, Baruch Hashem, slowly, slowly we are uh, releasing some Jews from prison. I believe more than 50 were released already. And the Hamas is playing with our heads. Give us another day and another day. For every day we'll give you 10 more. It's like a beggar. Come to the door, you throw him at a quarter, and then another quarter. The question is, what option we have? The answer is none. We care about life. They don't care about life. They can, they can care less. Thousands of their people die. It doesn't even tickle them. There's not really, not even a little tiny hard, heartache when they see their people are being bombed or whatever, they, care, they can care less. They sit in the tunnel, they prepare themselves good things over there. They enjoy, they don't care. They already knew in advance that that's what's going to happen and still did it because they are secure, they have nothing to worry about. But we care, we care about every person, every man, woman, child, older people, even people in their late 80s, we care about them. Because even one day of life, it's eternity. One day of life. If someone murdered a person an hour before he was supposed to die anyway, 120 years old, the doctor giving him a matter of maximum an hour or two to live, you can begin to see. And someone just choked him an hour before, that's 100% a murder. No difference murdering 20 years old or 120 years old. Even though when you murder a young boy, he had 80 years to live. You took 80 years of his life. You murder a 120 years old person, how, how much you stole from him? An hour, two hours, a day? Compare the same crime? It's not the same crime. The answer is 100% the same crime. Of course, you will get in the next world a much bigger punishment for the years that you took away from the young one. But as far as the murder, is 100% a murder. Meaning, if we had the Sanhedrin today, the person that choked him a minute before his death, a minute, will get the execution, the death penalty. Because if you take a minute of a life of a person, you deserve death penalty. Needless to say, when you take 80 years of life, you, you understand, right? The needless to say here. One minute, a person can enter eternity with a minute. Think for a second. Person was wicked all his life. All his life. He's now 90 years old. He has an hour to live. He doesn't know, maybe an hour, two hours. 
just before he dies, he said to all the people, I want all my money to go to save souls. Bring God's children back to him. I, I didn't live according to the Torah all, all my life. I didn't do anything right. Everything in my life was a mess. But before I leave the world, I want to fix it. Take my hundred million dollar and save more than two, three million people you can save with this money. You can turn them into Shomrei Shabbat. Open up their eyes, give them the USBs, give them books, invite them for Shabbatonim, for seminars, you know. So a person like this, if you kill them a minute before he made that declaration, you destroy the world. Think about it. If you would let him live another minute, he was able to make the declaration. The fact you killed him a minute before, destroyed the world, the Jewish world. Maybe a million ballet tshuva was just prevented from that one minute that you shot in his life. One minute. Usually the real problem is that a person is now regretting, is repenting before he dies. Usually, 99 out of 100 people, Jews and non-Jews, when they know they have minutes to live, they ask if they can talk, they talk. If they can only think, they think. They ask God to forgive them for the horrible things they did in their life. Sometimes they say it out loud in front of the family. Sometimes they leave a, a wheel or a letter. And sometimes they think about it. I remember one time my brother broke his arm. I had to, I had to go with him to the hospital. And one guy, it was Good Samaritan Hospital in Monsi, in Ermont. One guy called me, it was in the emergency room, they have like curtains, you know, it's not real rooms. They just divided it with the, with the truck. One guy called me if I can come and pray for his father. When I started to talk to him, I found out his mother is Jewish. So that means it wasn't uh, really a guy, meaning his father, the, the old man, his mother was Jewish, the grandma. So I started to... He was unconscious. He was like this, connected to machines. Very old man. My guess, 90 years old, at least. So I started to whisper in his, uh, in his ears. I don't know if he's listening or not. I spoke to his ear. Now it's the time to repent. Ask God to forgive you for all the mistakes you made. So the old man opened, almost barely opened up his eyes a little bit and moved his head kaha, like this, a little bit. Maybe that was the, the moment of his life, that minute. Then I said to my brother, you understand why you broke your arm now? Maybe this Jew needed someone to do vidui with him, for him to repent. Because that one last minute when a person asks for forgiveness, some people have sudden death. They don't have time to talk or to think. But those who prepared for their death, they have enough time to ask Hashem for forgiveness. What about all the money they owe? Big problem. They have to come back in Gilgul and return everything. What about the many horrible things that they did? They still have to pay for it. Just because Hashem accepts the tshuva of a person doesn't mean he's not going to get punished for his sins. The proof for it is the father of Avraham Avinu, Terach. Terach was an idol worshiper, Machti Arabim, selling idols to people. Before the end of his life, he repented. He did tshuva. Why Hashem made him able to do tshuva? Not to upset Avraham Avinu. That Avraham is going to heaven and his father will go to hell. So because of the love that Hashem had to Avraham Avinu, such huge love that he had to even consult with him before he wiped out all the wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Avraham is my lover. Avraham is avi. It's, it's written in the Torah. Avraham is my lover. I love him, he loves me. It's a love story between God and Abraham. So because Hashem didn't want Abraham to be upset, he gave Terach the schut to repent. But what happened to Terach? He had to come back in reincarnation. He didn't go to heaven. Yes, Hashem gave him an opportunity to repent. What was his end? He came back as Yov. And he had the biggest nightmare. His life was hell on earth. The life of Yov here. 
His children die, he lost all his money, he lost all his friends, got sick. Shh, disaster. His life was a disaster. I mean, it was great until a certain moment. And that's when Hashem started to pay him for all the things he did in his past life. Yesterday I uh, spoke about uh, an unbelievable case of three Israeli teenagers. If you remember 15 years ago, Arabs kidnapped them. Three, three boys somewhere in the south by the desert of Be'er Sheva there. They got kidnapped. Everyone was praying for them. I mean, everyone found out three boys were kidnapped. Three boys, a few hours later, they found out they were already murdered. Before we even started to pray for them, they murdered them in a car. It wasn't real kidnap. They just put them in a car in order for them to kill them. So one man, now there's a video, that the man had a triplet two years ago. Two years ago. 13 years after those guys died. 13 years. And he had a triplet. And the kids when they became two years old now, they came to the father and tell him, we are the three boys that were murdered. And one of them showed him, that's where I got shot, here and here. They went and checked. The boys had the bullet exactly where the little two years old kid said, I got shot here and here. One of them is a girl, meaning one of the boys came back as a girl. See the calculation of Hashem? Sometimes you come back as a boy, sometimes as a girl. Sometimes you can come back as a Kohen, you can come back as a Levi, you can come back rich, you can come back poor. But always as a person. Not necessarily. There's sometimes reincarnations in animals, but that's already a serious punishment. Reincarnation in animals is actually worse than hell. Why? Because they take a soul of a Jew, which is the highest thing in the world spiritually, even higher than the angels, they take that soul, which has a spark of Hashem in it, and they attach it to the nefesh of a dog, which is the filthiest thing, spiritually. Spiritually, we're not talking physically. It could be a nice dog, beautiful, fair, blue eyes, you know, these Siberian huskies. It's such a nice creation. It has nothing to do with how the dog looks. Ugly, like a rat, or beautiful... Nice, classy look. Nothing to do with that. It also doesn't make a difference if the dog is some kind of a, a dog of some sheikh and live in a palace and they take care of him like a king or a dog that looks in the garbage what to eat for today and freezing outside in the snow. It has nothing to do with the condition of the dog. It's just that they take the soul of a Jew, which is the purest thing, and they take the filthiest nefesh and attach them together for X amount of years. Five years, ten years that the dog will be here. That's a disaster. The soul has huge suffering for X amount of years. Usually these reincarnations are gays. They get this kind of punishment. That's before going to hell. That's one step before going to hell. Reincarnations in animals. It's terrible. P if people would only read the book of the Ariya Kadosh, Shara Gilgulim, <laughs> they will faint just from the options. Because some of the things that the Ariya Kadosh talks about, it's us. We are falling into that category. People who don't watch their eyes, look at non modest things on the street. People who speak Sashonara. You know, terrible things. So... It's, it's scary. If a person is, is ignorant, he is not aware of the consequences of his choices. He doesn't know what's waiting for him. It's not going to change the reality just because he didn't know. Just like when you drink poison in a glass, someone put poison, you don't know, but you still die. Not knowing that you're drinking poison does not change reality. When you know, you will die. When you don't know, you will also die. Reality is reality. So, you know, it's scary. If a person would only know, it's very, very scary. So, it it's reminds me always when I, tell it, when I talk about it, that 20-something years ago, I was invited to speak in a house of a Persian Jew in Great Neck. Persian family. Maybe the man was 40 years old, the woman a little bit younger. 
a few little young children. They invited me to the house. The house was very nice and big. I gave a nice lecture there. And I asked them after that, why well, you just moved to the house? Mazal Tov. They said, no, it's not our house. We're renting. We had a much nicer house than this. But we lost it. I got curious. So you lost it? What happened? He said, you didn't read about us in the newspapers? I said, no, I don't read newspapers. He said, you didn't read about my husband? He was all over the news. I said, no, what happened? Now the guy's telling me the story. Listen to this. He had a jewelry store in Manhattan. Successful jewelry, diamonds, gold. One day, five police officers broke in, put a sign, close, told them, you are under arrest for money laundering. Oh, you know, they have a list that they like to read. Usually none of this has nothing to do with the reality. They just made up a case. It was an innocent, nice man. None of the things they say was any, uh, nothing. They started to collect all the diamonds and the things. They put everything in bags, put handcuffs on him and took him to, uh, to jail, to arrest, like the store. He went to jail. He was in jail for six months, waiting for a trial. In the end, they found out that it was corrupted cops. They actually robbed him. Just, just found the Jew to rob. The city apologized to him, but never gave him back all the money. He lost millions of dollars. Therefore, he lost his home. Obviously, they took away his home. They never gave him back the home. Looking for justice in a secular court, keep dreaming. So they took away everything he has, and it was all over the news, corrupted cop, and he lost everything he had. Innocent man lost everything he had. Why am I telling you this story all of a sudden? What's the connection to this? The connection is that, uh, that uh, when he was in jail, guess who they put him in jail with, in the same room? With the head of the Italian mafia, John Gotti. They put him in the same room with John Gotti, and John Gotti made his life hell. He wasn't able to sleep, because he doesn't want him to snore or to make noise. You cannot fall asleep until I fall asleep. And uh, you have to fix his shoes. You know. He's threatening him, we're going to kill your family. If you're not going to do what I say to you. So he said to me, the jail and losing all my savings, it's not the problem. That was the, wasn't the main problem. The main problem that they attached me in a bunk bed to the biggest monster on earth. And that reminds me about this, that they take a Jewish soul and attach it to a nephesh of a dog. And they must be stuck together for X amount of years. This is really the suffering here. It doesn't matter what the dog does. The dog runs, the dog plays, the dog is happy, the dog is sad, the dog is hungry. Nothing to do with that. The soul constantly suffers regardless of the condition of the dog. But something is interesting because sometimes the animals know, meaning if you see that the animals behave in a certain way, that you can see that it knows that it's a Gilgul of someone. That's reincarnation. My aunt, they used to have a dog named Billy. In Israel, all the dogs are Americans, in case you didn't know. They have American names. Steve, Billy, <laughs> you know, all kinds of names. So Billy was a little black poodle with some curly hair. When the family became religious, they owned the dog. Usually religious people don't buy dogs, but they already were stuck with the dog, Billy. They moved from Ramle to Yerushalayim. And you know, in the Bukharian neighborhood of Yerushalayim, everyone is ultra, ultra orthodox. My uncle, Alava Shalom, had to take Billy three times a day. You know, he's walking with him in the street. All the black hats rabbis are looking at him. You have a dog? Why well, you own a dog? Big embarrassment. So one time he decided to give the dog to his son in Ramle. Still lives in Ramle. Ramle to Jerusalem is about 50 miles, something like that. 40, 50 miles. You know how far? How far it is? It's almost like from here to Monsi. It's far. A few days later, he came home. Billy sitting by the door. He walked 50 miles 
he remembered the way and he arrived all the way back to the house. He went to Rav Ben Sion, Abba Shaul Zatzal, he told him the case, he told him there's nothing you can do, Tsar Ba'ale Chaim. You have to raise him until he die. And what about the shame? Shame erase all your past sins, it's good. Accept it with love. And a few, few years later he died, both of them died, my uncle and Billy. But, but, why did I tell you this story about Billy? Five days a year, Billy refused to eat. You give him food on Tisha B'Av, he doesn't touch the food, doesn't touch the water. Rom Kippur, he doesn't eat. Shvaisre Betamuz, Asara Beteve, Ta'anit Esther, he doesn't eat. Five or six times, Tzom Gdalia also. Every day of a fast, unbelievable, a dog. My aunt swore many times, I asked her, are you serious? Or you are imagining? She told me, no, it was already known. Every time I give him food in a fast day, he refused to eat. It's probably a gilgul of someone who used to eat in a fast day. And also, you know, there used to be a, a, a great speaker named, named Rav Nisim Yagen. He passed already. I don't know, about 20 something years ago he passed. Before he passed, there was very, very powerful speaker. It couldn't be that you go to his lecture and you wouldn't almost faint. Almost faint. It was uh, very, very intense, scary. You, were, you get the point what life is about. It wasn't like some of the speeches today, five million years you listen to them, you won't make one progress, nothing. By him, one or two lectures, shake you up. Either you become Baal Tshuva or you run. Can, he can handle the truth. Depends if you're a faker or if you're an honest person. Fakers run. Real people come to get more punches. You know, the kids, some of them wants to go to the dentist to get it over with, and some avoid the appointment no matter what. So it's going to become root canal. Right now, it's only feeling. 20 minutes, you're done. Wait another month, there will be root canal. You're going to have to go two times, three times, a, a crown. Root canal is also dangerous for other things in the body. They have lead in it, or mercury, I don't know, all kinds of things. It can kill you. And go to the brain. There's problems with that. So the kid wants to live the moment. Right now I manage. I eat on the, my right side. That's a fool. But almost all kids are like that. They do everything they can to avoid the dentist. By the time they won't be able to avoid the dentist, they'll pay ten times more. Pain and money. That's a stupid reaction. Smart person... Beg, take me today to the den. Don't you have an appointment today? I don't want to wait for tomorrow. Why? I have a serious problem. Before it becomes ten times worse, let me fix it. Most of us are like this. We'll deal with that when we really have no choice. Just like the Israeli stupid government. For 30 years they knew Hamas collecting thousands of rockets every month. They saw the rockets, the intelligence saw that they, they, from Iran, they bring to Lebanon, to Hezbollah, 250,000 missiles. What, what did you wait for? What, what do you think? They, they buy these missiles to put them as a Christmas tree, maybe? Maybe they'll use it for Hanukkah bush? What are they buying all these rockets for? For whom? For us. What, did, what took you so long? Until you... Now they're reacting. After a thousand died, they could have prevented that tragedy. But this is the way, this is the Israeli mentality. Hafif. Everything is Hafif. In Israel, they have a word, Hafif. If you don't know what it is, Google it. Chet, Pei, Yud, Ending Pei. Hafif. Hafif means when your cleaning lady comes, she see that you're not looking, she push all the sand under the rug or under the, the couch. It looks nice from the outside until you move the couch. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you have under a treasure? You understand? That's called hafif. Hafif. 
So Rav Nisim Yagel one time was invited to speak in New Jersey. One 20 years old boy died in a car accident. He happened to be in New York. They called his uh, assistant. Can the rabbi come tomorrow to speak in the shiva? The whole family here. It's going to be a lot of chilonim here. He used to hear chilonim, put everything on hold and run. He came over there, nice house in New Jersey somewhere. He started to give a, a speech there to all the people. In the middle of a speech, they hear like scratching on the, wo- on the door, <coughs> like this, no, like noise outside. What's this? The owner of the house opened the door. Wow, a huge dog. Everybody started to scream, close the door, close the door. But the door already went in. When well, he closed the door on his head, he walked in. But he, did, he wasn't aggressive. Not barking, not jumping, walking, depressed. Sad dog. Walks. You know, walk, walk, walk. And sat on a big couch. The single couch. Everyone was looking, everybody was nervous. He told that story in one of the next speeches. He told the story, what happened in his speech in New Jersey. So they said, what's going on here? He asked the, the owner of the house, tell me, but be honest with me. Did your son have a non-Jewish girlfriend? He said, yes, very serious. He said, this is your son sitting right here in a couch. In front of the whole family. This is where your son came back. It's true he was sitting right here in front of the TV, right? Say so right here. This was his favorite chair. Big dog sitting right there. Came to the Shiva. It's written in the Zohar that the Neshama goes back and forth from the house of the Shiva to the grave. In this particular case, Hashem reincarnated his soul in a living dog. It was a dog. And now the soul of that Jew got merged together with the nefesh of that dog. And now it takes him all to, to that place. Sitting there, not barking, not doing anything. If I remember correctly, remember he told that story more than 20 years ago. If I remember correctly, but don't, don't count on it 100%, he stayed there the entire seven days and left right after that. If I remember correctly, I think that's how he ended the story. But regardless, whether he left the same day or a few days later, you got the point. Everything is reincarnations. Three boys are being kidnapped. Probably they were 20 or younger than 20. They get murdered. They come back as triplets. Triplets. What is going on here? One, Hashem took three boys. They were not brothers. They get murdered by a monster Nazi Hamas. And they come back as triplets in one delivery. So I want to teach you another secret. When a person dies, if Hashem has to send him back in reincarnation as a normal person, meaning not uh, Down syndrome or autistic or in, in re, on re, reincarnation of plants, fruits, animals, and raw material, none of that. Just a regular person with a free will, like us, that can choose what to do, what not to do. If Hashem decided that He's giving him another chance to be born again in a new body and to have another life here, that maybe this time it will be righteous, Sometimes Hashem gives him few options. How do you want to be born? In Lakewood? In Bnei Brak, In Jerusalem? These are your options. This is the family. You see this man? You see this woman? They already have two, three kids. You're going to be the next baby. You want it? What are my options, Hashem? Then you have another option. Hippies from the kibbutz. Look at the husband. He has a earring over here. Horse tail in the back. You know, all day beer and smoke. You want that family? Why would I want this family? I would rather go to that rabbi. Because from this family you start very low. There's no Torah over there. 
but you're going to have to find the truth from there. But the reward is much bigger. He chose. Then he asked him, in your past life, the life you just finished, you were not watching your eyes. You're looking at dirty things. You knew that it's forbidden, but you still did it. Internet, phone, smartphone, on the street, movies, Hollywood garbage. Do you want to be born with eyes or you want to be born blind? If you will be born blind, you will never commit that sin again. You won't be able to see dirty things. But for sure, you're going to make it. Guarantee not to sin. Or you want to be born with eyes, which there is always a chance that you will sin again. But there's no guarantee you will have another chance to be reincarnated. Maybe the next time you're going to go to Kafakela. It's a million times worse. Some people choose to come back blind. Mida keneged mida. Some people choose to come back without legs. It's all in the end in a discussion in a court of heaven. Sometimes they let you choose. Sometimes Hashem decides for you. Whether you like it or not, it's your problem. You know, if you remember about 10 years ago, when I spoke about the autistic kids, it's a lot of noise. Controversial rabbi. All these fools who call me controversial rabbis, the problem is in them. They have no knowledge. If they had the knowledge, they would not look at anything here controversial. It's 100% Torah, Gemara, Ari Kadosh. <laughs> they just never read it. They will read it once in their life. They wouldn't open their mouth. So I spoke about the fact that uh, there is a way, t- they found a way to communicate with autistic kids. And they describe that they, in their past life, and you know, and why they came back as autistic kids. They describe that when you, when you communicate with them. In regular way, they don't speak. Speechless, they can, they can speak. They, but through the computer, if you bring their hands to the computer, they begin to type. If they don't look at the keyboard. You see that the soul is moving the hand. It doesn't even look at the keyboard. It's like this. He types. You see on the screen what he says. Scary. So, I spoke about that. Usually when a person is reincarnated with some problem, physical, spiritual problem, is continuation from past life. So, for instance, uh, if they have problem with the speech and hearing, understanding, analyzing what they hear, functioning according to that, it's very possible that it's because in their past life they spoke Lashon Hara, gossip, stuff like that. They enjoy gossip, which is against the Torah. But not once or twice. Daily. 30, 40, 50 years, non-stop gossip. You know these people? They can't stop talking gossip. Every time they come to your house, the sins begin by the second. Another one, and another one, and another one. You can't stop them. So people started to scream, ah, they... then someone sent me a video in Israel, twins were born. Now they are 20 years old at the time of the video, boy and a girl, in one delivery. The girl was born no regular, normal, and the boy was born autistic, twins. Now there is a convention. There's an organization in Israel, they have an auditor, auditorium, it's full of audience. They ask the girl to talk. She takes the microphone and she now describes how she became religious. <coughs> now she, tell, she talks about her and her son and her, and her brother, that they're born. And her brother keeps talking to them and rebuking them. Shame on you. Why you behave like this? Why you don't keep Shabbat? Or this and that. Constantly. He attacked the family. Because they already communicate with him. So he constantly tell them, you should change your lifestyle. So now they decided to make a video with the brother. Now I don't have to tell you that autistic kids are not exactly actors in Broadway. Right? They don't know how to act. They're 100% real. Whatever they have to say, they say. They don't know how to be actors. So you can see the video. I put it a few times in my Facebook page. We even made, I even paid someone to do uh, subtitles to it in English. Because the interview is in Hebrew. 
So there is a religious man. He asked the boy questions and the boy answered with the computer. So he asked him, why were you born like this? And he types, I did things that I was not allowed to do in my past life. As a result of that, Hashem sent me to the world like this. And now he asks him, what did you do? He said, he didn't want to say. He's trying to avoid the question. He said, I spoke things that I was not supposed to speak. And he doesn't leave him alone. Tell me what you spoke. He said, I spoke Lashon Ara about people, gossip about people. And as a result of that, Hashem sent me back to the world autistic. 100% in front of your eyes. I have nothing to do with this. Most of the critics disappeared and hide. You know how when you prove wrong, you made a lot of noise? Like this, Imachshima, this model Arab, this every day she makes up another story about Israel. So yesterday she said that the Israeli chopped organs from Palestinian. So now I heard that today she apologized. I didn't check the facts. It's all planned. You make a buzz, and then nobody remembered the apology after that. The noise continued to go. The noise continued. So people that saw that video got the shock of their life. You see the words of the Ariya Kadosh from 500 years ago in front of your eyes. Cannot uh, plan such thing. Cannot do a scam here. An autistic child is telling you that's the reason I came to the world like this because I used to speak bad about people. Did anyone apologize to me? No. I don't care. I don't need their apology. My goal is for people to learn the truth. It's nothing... Uh, I don't, I'm not looking for fan clubs. <laughs> fan club. Mm -hmm. Oh, we with you. Thank you very much. You're with me. You're against me. That's really no big deal. What's important is that the truth of the Torah will be revealed to everyone. Every ignorant will be able to see the truth. That's what we have to work on. By the way, you should know, it's not, it's not only my obligation to do Kiruv and to rebuke the world. The rabbis that do it, it's not only their obligation. Everyone that speaks here tonight, sits here tonight, everyone who watches us live, has the same exact obligation to save souls. It's not only on me, or on that rabbi, or on this rabbi. No. Every Jew has this obligation. So every person has to find, according to his skills, how he can contribute to that important mission. So for instance, those who know how to talk, they can convince people. Those who have nice homes with good delicious food, and they can invite people to taste a little bit from what Shabbat is, that's very, very good. Because a lot of people fall in love with Shabbat from a Shabbat table. Just from the food. Wow. Every Shabbat I'll have... I want family like this. I want children like this. I want a mother's wife like this. That's it. Rabbi, I want the same life. I want to get married and live the same lifestyle. Ah, but do you know if the Torah is divine or not? I don't care. That's the life I want. We don't want people to follow Torah based on faith only. It's not good enough. The Torah demand to know I'm your God. To know, to know, not to believe. To know. To know the Torah is divine. To know that we had Muhammad Ar Sinai. We got the Torah in front of millions of witnesses. You cannot deny such a thing. That, that God is giving the Torah to millions of Jews and the entire Torah is about their life in the last year in Egypt. Every miracle that happened to them. So if they won't confirm one of them, then you know that it's not a divine book. Because God doesn't come to millions of people and tell them fairy tales. I did this for you, I did that for you. So excuse me, what movie you watched? I, I haven't been in Egypt. I didn't see the Red Sea opening up. I didn't see every firstborn in Egypt die. I didn't see billions of frogs. I didn't see all of that. What are you telling me that it happened to me? The fact that everyone agreed to accept the Torah and accept Moshe as a leader, 
leaves no doubt whatsoever that every miracle that is written in a book actually happened to them. Because no one will make himself look like an idiot coming to millions of people with a book claiming that God gave him the book and the entire book is about them. Who knows better than them what really happened? You see, in Islam you don't have such thing. Muhammad doesn't give the Arabs a book that talks about the miracles that happened to them. Because nothing happened to them. I was alone in a desert, an angel Jibril. Jibril means Gabriel. Jibril gave me the Quran. Any prophecies there? Zero. No prophecy. Just if they copy certain things from the Torah or from the Jewish prophet, that doesn't make it a holy book. <laughs> Everyone can copy it, even in a newspaper. They can copy the prophecy of Zechariah. So what, the newspaper became holy? Because some lefty liberal reporter copy a prophecy from the book of Zechariah? So now New York Times will be holy? So if they copy something to their fake book, doesn't make it any holier. They copy from Yeshaya, from Amos, Haggai, from all these prophets. That's not a prophecy in their book. Show me one new prophecy. Why Muhammad never gave prophecies? Because he knew that he's not a prophet. He knew it. If I come and I give a fake book, pretending to be a prophet, a leader, I wouldn't take a risk writing an actual prophecy because it's just a matter of time until people will realize I'm full of it. Full of baloney. <laughs> Look at these prophecies. None of it happened. Why taking a risk? I'll take a sword. Everyone who would not obey my rules, I'll chop his head off. That's the language people understand. That's how Islam started. And what has changed after 1400 years? Same exact thing. Same thing that happened in the first day of Islam is happening right now, but by millions of people. In the beginning it was Muhammad only, and a group. Today it's a whole... <laughs> it's all over the world. It spreads all over the world and pr probably it's already too late to do something about it. Too late. So Rabotai, we got the understanding here how it works. That leads me to what we read on Shabbat, I didn't finish yesterday in my lecture in Queens, the story of Yaakov Avinu, the life of Yaakov. The life of Yaakov was extremely difficult, very hard life. His daughter was attacked and kidnapped, raped. He lost his, the love of his life, Rachel, when she was 36. He was taken advantage 20 years as a servant working for a crook, Lavan. 20 years he took advantage on him. His brother came with 400 missionaries, miss, miss, uh, miss, uh, what do you say? Mercenaries. 400 mercenaries to murder him. 20 years he had to hide for him. Ran away, cannot be with his parents, cannot see his parents. Why? Because he knows his brother are looking all over for him to kill him. It's not easy. If you know 400 Hamas terrorists, are looking for you. It's not a pleasant feeling, you know. So, <laughs> what happened in the end? His life wasn't easy. He's the love of his life, Yosef, 17 years old, they come with the outfit that is all ble full of blood. Your son was eaten by a bad animal. The son, the daughter, the wife, and then hunger, you have to leave your land, you have to move to a different country. Very hard life. Even when Yaakov came to Paro, Paro saw that Yaakov looks very old. He said to him, how old are you? 117 he was. He looks like 180, like, like Avraham, Yitzchak. He said to him, uh, my life was very difficult. That's when HaKadosh Baruch Hu was upset and say, I'm preparing for you the best life to come, the best Olam Abba. And you now want to rest? We came for a picnic? What do you mean? I'm 117 years old. There's not a tragedy that I didn't have. 
What did I do all my life? I was a holy person. You changed my name to Israel. The nation of Israel is coming out of me. You promised me the holy land. I want to relax. I want to retire. Let me be with the family. What happened? Hashem wasn't happy. Why? Suffering is for your own good. Don't do me a favor that you agree to accept the suffering with love. It's for your own good. We feel so great that we accept the suffering with understanding. I can't say that most Jews accept suffering with love. Because even Chazal say, Lo hem velo scharam. They ask each other, you want some suffering? He say, I don't want the suffering and I don't want the reward of the suffering. Meaning the greatest rabbis in the history were trying to avoid suffering. So who are we to accept suffering with love? So at best case scenario, we accept it with understanding that we deserve it. We brought it on ourselves. And now when we suffer is going to erase some of, our, uh, some of our problems, whatever we actually did. That's what's going to happen. But to say that we accept it with love, unfortunately we're not in that level. But we feel so great. I'm such a tzaddik. I never blame anyone for my suffering but myself. That's a very high level in this generation. Wow. Because everyone finds a victim to blame. It's his fault. It's that fault. It's the prime minister. It's that. It's the army. It's uh, Hussein. It's this. It's that. There's always a lot of scapegoats. Usually people don't want to accept responsibility for their actions. As King Solomon already wrote about it 3,000 years ago. Ivelet adam tesalef darko. Hashem is aflibo. The stupidity of a person will turn him away from the right path. And who is going to blame? Hashem, not himself. He's going to blame Hashem. Anyone here can raise his hand and say it never happened to him? That you have complained, Hashem, why are you doing this to me? Why now? The worst timing. At least you wait a month. Why right now? Why did I miss the flight? I'm going to miss the wedding. It's not fair. Why are you doing it to me? Flat tire, pouring rain. You couldn't do it tomorrow when it's sunny. So let's see. One, uh, one, other, one of the tricks that happened to Yaakov, he, got some, he gets up in the morning, sun is rising. Remember, there was no electric, so it's very dark at night. Lavan pushed into the chupa the other daughter. And since Yaakov had simanim with, uh, with Rachel, he told her certain alachot, ilchot nida, and she taught everything to Leah, and Leah was able to answer. There's another opinion that actually uh, Rachel hid in a room and was answering instead of her. Remember, it's pitch dark. It's not like today, you have light everywhere. You can find out who is with you in a room. In the morning, he found out that it wasn't there. So what happened? This is what we have to understand. In the morning, all of a sudden, it's Leah. At that time, the Gemara now is talking about the Midrash. Midrash Echa. What does Midrash Echa say? What does it mean, At that time. Who knows what the Midrash talks about? In the time of the destruction of the temple. That Jews are going now to exile. The Goim destroyed the temple and they're sending the Jews out of Israel. At that time, Rachel jump in front of Hashem and say, Ribbono Shel Olam, you know Yaakov loved me very much and worked for my father seven years. And then when the time came, he replaced me with my sister. It was very hard for me. 
We had simanim, but I had mercy on my sister. I told her the simanim, not to, not to embarrass her. So do the same thing for my children. Mida keneged mida. Everything you do is measure for measure, no? I gave up my honor, I gave up my dignity, I gave up on my life, I gave up on the man I love, I gave up on everything. Right? To have mercy on someone else. So you have mercy on my children. Now Abraham tried, Yitzchak tried, Yaakov, it didn't help. From all the legendary holy people, the only claim that helped was the claim of Rachel. Claim of Rachel lowered the judgment against the Jewish nation. Moshe Rabbeinu tried, didn't help. Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, they all asked for mercy on, their chil- on the children of Israel. Once Rachel spoke, Hashem agreed. The question is, what was greater about Rachel than all these holy people? You know, the exile of Egypt is the root of all the exiles. We had few other exiles after that. Even now we, have, we are in exile. But that was the first exile, Yerida le Mitzrayim. Since the nation of Israel came out of Egypt before they finished the 400 years, how many years we were in Egypt? 210. So 190 years earlier we left. HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, you still have debt to pay. That's okay, I'll collect it in payments. I'll collect it in payments. Why did they have to go to Egypt? What was the cause? Throwing Yosef to the pit. Jealousy. Okay. Jealousy. Now let's learn. Yosef was supposed to be the firstborn. If Lavan would not replace Leah and Rachel, so the first son of Yaakov would be the son of Rachel. First son came out of Rachel is Yosef. So Yosef is supposed to be the firstborn. Because he did a trick, then he went to Leah instead of Rachel. Right? Then Reuven came. The brothers, they couldn't stand the fact that Yaakov loved Yosef the most. It made them very jealous. They said, Reuven is the firstborn. Why is treating Yosef like he's the firstborn? Mm-hmm. But Yaakov knew that without that trick, Yosef should have been his firstborn. So he learned with him. He gave him special attentions. Also, he came up from the woman he loves. Meaning, he, not that he didn't love Leah. He also loved Leah. But he loved Rachel more. How do we know he loved Leah? Isn't it written, Vayar Hashem kisnua Leah, Vayiftach et Rachma? Hashem saw that Leah is hated, so he opened up her wound, that she can conceive and give more birth. So from here we see that a woman that gave children to a man, automatically he loved her more than a woman who didn't give him children. That was the way of people. Today it's usually the other way around. Oof, Mark, how many kids? Rabbi, I can't. Every time I come near here, that's it. I have another child. What's going on here? Because people don't appreciate what they get. Stupidity. Selfishness. Stinginess. It cost a million dollars to raise a child in New York. I don't have that much money. Rabbi, another kid, I'm going to need food stamps. Why people speak such nonsense? Because they never read that the Torah said that every human being is born with his own living. You don't have to feed him. You don't have to take care of your children. It's an illusion. (laughs) It's the other way around. They take care of you, you fool. Thanks to them, you get extra budget. Every time you have a child in the next Rosh Hashanah, Hashem is going to add X amount of money to to your annual budget. Now, if that child... Supposed to be Elon Musk. Supposed to be a spoiled rich American kid. So from a very young age, you all of a sudden, the father became a multi-millionaire, wins the lottery. 
He won the lottery for the boy, not for himself. If that boy wouldn't be born, he would never win the lottery. The reason he won the lottery is because one of his kids has mazal to be rich. And what's the proof for that? Once the kid leaves the house, usually the income of the parents is dropping tremendously. Why? As long as the kid were in the house, their parnasa was sent to the father. Sent to the father. You know, when the manna was falling every day, when a couple came to Moshe Rabbeinu and the woman complained, my husband disrespect me. He's so abusive. You know, in America it's a very common word. He's very abusive. Husbands don't know how to treat their wives, unfortunately. Many husbands are huge. I repeat my word. Huge criminals. Even if they have a big, nice yarmulke and a black sombrero and very long beard and sometimes even very nice peot that they fix all day. And when they dive in, they make faces. Oof, they never miss the day of mikveh. And they are huge criminals for the way they are ungrateful to their wives, abuse them, curse, violence. Oof, the stories I hear. You know how many low life men beat up their wives here in New York? I can fill up a book from the cases I heard. Book. A whole book. Thicker than this book. Thicker. From the last 30 years, how many cases I heard about. How can a person look at himself in a mirror a second and not vomit when you know he just punched a woman in the face? Forget about your wife. Any woman. Woman curses you in the street. When you're going to beat her up, you're a low life. What kind of a man beat up a woman? <clears throat> now, who does he beat up? The woman that does everything for him. Cook for him, laundry, shopping, raising his children. So what's going to be the excuse? I'm depressed. I can't find a job, I cannot do this, I cannot do that. Why is it her fault? She suffers more than you. You can't even bring food to the table because Hashem is punishing you in Parnassah. So you take your anger on an innocent woman. If anyone supports you right now, it's her. There's nowhere else you get support from. But that's the problem with people. First, ungratefulness. Second, selfishness. Third, anger. Fourth, ego and pride. Fifth, jealousy, laziness. Lots of issues with this man. So he's a loser, and she pays the price. She pays the price. So, so now, Hashem said, I'm going to give you the exile in installments, because it's still 190 years. So what happened? He makes a beautiful outfit to Yosef. The brothers get jealous. They can't stand it. They throw him to the pit. He ends up in Egypt. All of that Hashem prepares for the Jews to go back, to go to exile, because Hashem already told Avraham Avinu, your children has to be 400 years. So why did they come out after 210? Because the Egyptians tortured them more than what they're supposed to. They loved it. That's like the Nazis. There was a decree that millions of us would die. But there was no decree that the Nazi would sit and enjoy when he blow up a head of a baby. There's no decree for that, that he would sit and smoke a cigar and, and, and listen to classic music and enjoy to choke people and drown them in a, in a water. They chose to do it. Those people had to die. But did the murderer ad- enjoy it? Dance? Laugh for that is going to pay for thousands of years in the worst place in hell. For that alone. Do you know we, we the Jewish people, those who are religious, most of our punishments will be not for the actual sins. For what comes after. It's a clear verse. It's written. Hineni nishpat 
אותך על אומרך לא חטאתי. Most of your trial will focus on the audacity, the chutzpah that you have to say I did not do anything wrong. I don't deserve this. Why am I getting it? For the complaints that comes after. No regret, no shame, no repentance. Instead what? I'm good. I need tzaddik. Why, why are you tzaddik? Because he goes to the mikveh every day. Is this an obligation from the Torah? No. But there's a huge obligation from the Torah to respect his wife, like a queen, never to torture her. Not to talk about that if the men would know that when they torture them, how much money they lose every time they put their wife down, <laughs> they'll kill themselves. Do you know how much money they lose? Because every time a woman cries, the parnasa of the husband gets hurt. Guarantee. Guarantee. Oh, you may say, oh, but he made a million dollars this year instead of three. Two million went down the drain because of his stupidity for two or three incidents. No apology, no regret, no nothing. Hashem took away 60-70% of his income. So when a child is born, his parnasa comes with him. Tinok ba velachmo biyado, Chazal say. His own budget. You're not doing him a favor to feed him. If any, the more children you have, at least one of them has to be rich. I have a friend, he has maybe, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 brothers and sisters. Something like that, 11 or 12. Many, many brothers and few sisters. All of them are multi, multi millionaires. It's unbelievable. Where did you see a family like this? 11 or 12 kids, every one of them is a real estate tycoon. On buildings, stores, malls. All over the world, houses here, houses there. Every month they buy another house and another villa and this and factories. I wonder what was the schut of those parents? It's two religious parents in Israel. They have so many kids. Every one of them is a multimillionaire. Why? Sometimes Hashem takes all the people that are supposed to be rich and put them in one place. Also true. Sometimes a very rich family, they have few kids, and the father gets tons of money and he distributes it to those who are supposed to grow up rich. Don't be jealous with the rich people. Their test is much harder than everyone else. You don't believe me? Go to every one of the billionaires. Ask him on the side, off the record, just between me and you. Do you really give maser? The answer is probably not. There are some who does, but the more he makes, the harder it is to give. A person makes $10 million a year. He has to give minimum a million. True, he has to give a lot more than a million, but minimum a million. It's very hard to give a million. If a person makes 20000 a year, how much he has to give? 2000 a year. 100 and something a month. That's it. Not so hard. The more the harder it is to give. How many times you heard that people say, Rabbi, when I'm going to make money, do you know how much money I'm going to give to Kiruv? You will never have to ever hint about it in your lectures ever again to donate. Whatever you need, I'll give you an open check. Now I want to ask you a question. When the people say it, they mean it or it's a trick? They know they won't give a penny. Or they actually mean it to give. I know for sure, I give every one of them the benefits of the doubt, that everyone who ever told me that, meant it. Maybe one or two didn't. But almost everyone, and I heard it hundreds of hundreds of times. I'm sure that they really meant it. Like in his mind, I wish I had a few millions right now. I would write a check for two, three hundred thousand right away. But what happened? Many of those people became very rich. Some of them I sent to real estate. I even told them what office to go. I spoke to the owner, take him. 
teach him, help him. Now he has his own office and he owns a lot of places and doesn't give a penny. So what happened? The time that he promised what he promised, he actually had it in mind. I wish I can give. But once it became reality, the Satan showed up. Good afternoon, Moshe. Nice to meet you. Who are you? I'm your biggest nightmare. You really think I'm going to let you support Kiruv? Save thousands of people every year with your millions? In your dream. I will destroy the world before I will allow you to write even one $180 check. I told you once the story that I once <laughs> went to a lecture of one of the richest shuls in the world. The amount of people that are rich in that shul probably has about, altogether, about $50 billion. And that community alone, very rich people, tycoons, own building, every building a billion, half a billion. But there's a lot of people. The shul itself is a very fancy place. So one woman called me up. She had an older son and an older girl, like close to 30. This woman was 55, 60 at that time. It's more than 20 years ago. Rabbi, I need to talk to you about my son. I said, okay, I'm coming tonight to the shul. She said, no, no, I don't want to wait after and near, near people. I don't want people to see that I talk to you. So I said, what am I going to do? She said, there's a parking lot of the bank one block away. Can you meet me for a few minutes over there? I talk to you on the street. I said, yes. I went there. I started to talk to her. The first word she said, Rabbi, I would like to make a donation to your wonderful work of $52. Wow. Thank you very much. You're going to understand in a minute why I'm laughing. I said, thank you very much. It's good? I said, very good. As we speak, she tells me about the problem she has with her son. Rabbi, if you don't mind today, it will be 36. I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> As we continue, she said, Rabbi, uh, please don't be upset, but today it's going to be 18. I said, no problem, no problem, 18, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Why am I laughing? <laughs> I finally went down from 52 to 18, but the, when she wrote the check for $18, I saw that she's about to drop dead. I saw the pain in her face, like she's suffering. There are people like this in the world. That's their test in life. Generosity is their problem. Some people are very generous only with themselves, but no one else. They cannot benefit anyone. That's one issue. Some people <coughs> are very stingy with themselves also, not just with people. They're afraid to do something, maybe they're gonna have to eat again. All day they think, you know how they check the electric bill, they check every little thing. The credit card bill comes, his wife has to stand like a soldier. <laughs> Can I forget? Yes, sir. Stand right here. Let's see what you did this month. Oh, what is this Nine ninety nine in a bagel store? Where the bagel? How many times I told you rye bread costs $2? Why are you buying a bagel? Imagine you have a husband like this. You check every little thing. <laughs> so some people are stingy, not just for others, for themselves as well. Some people are stingy for themselves, but they're very generous for others. They don't waste a penny on themselves, only to give others. I know a few people like this. They themselves, lousy car, cheap outfit, $50 watch, every one of the son, psh, living the life. But the father, down to earth. I know one like this. He sponsors a lot of yeshivot in Israel. There's a guy who owns a lot of real estate in England. He lives in a most simple home, drives a very simple car, but give tons of money for tzedakah. Almost all his money goes to charity. 
One time there was a family that had a boy that had cancer, lo alenu. So they had to come to America for one year of treatment. This was over 20 years ago. The rent of the house he rented for them was $2,600 a month. In Muncie. A nice home, private home. That they can have a place. He put their other kids in yeshivot, paid the tuition, gave them all the money for the food, paid the electric. Basically, they cost him minimum seven, eight thousand dollars every month for one year. A hundred thousand dollars just to help them to be in America for one year, that they should get the boy treated. Everything he paid. So I laughed because the owner of the house that rented it to him is one of my best friends in life. So I once told my friend, <laughs> what an interesting world we live in. The tenants that are living in your house right now live much fancier than the one who pays all the bills. His house is not so nice like the house he got for them. Do you know how much Hashem loves a person like this? Words cannot describe how much Hashem loves a person like this. Do you know what's waiting for this tzaddik when he comes to the next world? Down to earth, no show off, no materialism, Torah, chesed, all, that's it. You know, Rabbi Udana, see, before he passed, he said, Hashem, you are my witness. I never enjoyed this world. Ten fingers. These fingers never enjoyed the world. It was a billionaire. Very rich. But everything he had, he gave to others. All the poor people come to eat by his house, table full of greatness. They come, they eat, they go. Him? His mind was only in Torah. He didn't care. One house, chandelier, rag, this. None of that I care about. Sometimes it's the wife she wants. Every American wife has a dream. What's her dream? Besides having 300 pairs of shoes, what's the main dream in the life of a woman? To have the fanciest kitchen. What's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. Almost all women, between the teilim and all the good things that they do, they have a therapy. What's the therapy that the women love? Cook shows. There's all kinds of gurus. Every woman who knows how to cook, make herself, I don't know, what do you call it? A blog, a page. Today we're going to cook this and this and that. Some of them don't even know how to cook, but they already have a name, you know. But it's always the fanciest kitchen, like in the magazines, you know, $200,000 kitchen. Best refrigerator, best oven, $15,000 oven, professional one. <laughs> so the poor wives of the Avrechim, they live in the basement with an oven from the time of Antiochus. You have to heat it to turn on. It doesn't, you know, doesn't. So now she sits now for an hour watching this fancy lady with her cook show. And right away she's starting to think, why do I need to be a wife of an Avrech? Why do I need his life? I could have had that life. Look at her with her fancy wig and a 10, ta- ten carat diamond. Look at me with my tiny Toyota <laughs> choking on the highway. And she started driving her husband crazy. Moshe, I'm sorry, I didn't sign for it. It's too much for me, I can't. He comes home from the caller. Uh, what happened, Sarah? <laughs> I can't take it anymore. What happened in the end? He leaves the kolel. Whose fault it is? The, pep, the people that like to flash their wealth everywhere. If they don't do it for that purpose, no problem at all. Shem knows what you think. Do you know sometimes there are women that are looking for reason to do Sheva Brachot? She doesn't know the Chatan Bechlal. She doesn't know who he is. There is Chatan, is a... Should we do Sheva Brachot for him? Sheva Brachot is $5,000. Ma, 40 people, meals, that, fish, meat. It's expensive. So what, Moshe, Baruch Hashem, Hashem, bless you, you know. Things working well. 
what is the whole purpose of this Sheva Brachot that she's so anxious to cook for a week that everyone will see her new home and her delicious food? Did she really think about the Chatan? Mitzvah Lesameh, Chatan Vekala? I hope so. The problem is you can fool me, you can fool you, but you can't fool Hashem. If the entire thing is just for the show off, it doesn't consider a mitzvah. It's avera. It's a night of a show off, and I can, Hashem cannot stand show off. Remember this. And you know, I didn't write the Torah. I didn't make the rules. It's written, Toavat Hashem kol gvalev. Everyone that is a show off, I cannot stand him. Says who? God himself. Not the rabbi. God say. I can't stand show of people. I can't stand them. When they buy a watch, it has to be the most fancy, expensive, huge size of a watermelon. What is this? You're a religious guy. What do you need this watch for? Everything by him has to be special. If you do it for the honor of Shabbat, Lichvot Shabbat Kodesh, okay. Hashem knows you're doing it Lichvot Shabbat. I remember one time I had a Shabbaton by one of the richest Jews in the world. He invited to his house 70 people that Shabbat. And I was the guest speaker that Shabbat. I went with my family and I had a little kid, probably two, three years old at that time. And uh, I saw that they serving with gold, gold plates and, and glasses. Gold, real gold. The, the glass is full of gold. I said to myself, this glass is probably a few thousand dollars. Now I see my two, three years old playing with the glass. It's just a matter of time until he's going to smash on the floor. I mean, billionaire, billionaire, but the last thing I want is my boy to smash two, three thousand dollars glass on the floor. Why do I need this responsibility? So I took it away from him and I went to the kitchen, asked the, the, the woman over there, the maid, you have any plastic cups? So she went to the closet, she got plastic cup, I bought him. When the billionaire saw <laughs> that my little kid is drinking with a white plastic cup, his eyes came out. He ran to me, Rabbi, what happened? Say, eh, you know, as a little boy, I, I'm afraid he's gonna break. I hope he's gonna break it. Lichvot Shabbat Kodesh. Quickly bring it back to him. Needless to say, I was still very nervous the entire meal. Every time he makes a move, but this is a person who wants to do. He doesn't need to show off. Everyone knows he's one of the richest people in the world. He needs to show off. You know, some people, they already passed that level. You don't need to show off. The opposite, those people that everyone knows that they are the richest, they're very casual. Very casual. Someone told me that this guy, Warren Buffett, drives a very old car and lives in a very, very old fashioned house. If it's true or not, I don't know. But what does he need to prove? He has billions of dollars. No, he's buying another house and another house. That's what the Satan does to us. The Satan will do everything he can that we will spill our money to the garbage on things that will not bring us any credit. Some of us are addicted to materialism, so he finds us all kinds of toys to buy. This car, that watch, this one, that one. That's how the money goes. Those who are not uh, addicted, he finds them causes to invest the money that are worthless. Big Hanukkah party. How much you need, Rabbi? We're making a single event. How much? Food, Chinese food, donuts, this, DJ, $25,000. All right. Stop by my office. The check will be ready in an hour. 25,000, Hanukkah party, boys, girls, Shem Irachem, what's happening there? Hanukkah party of Sodom and Gomorrah, inside the synagogue uh, catering hall. Boys, girls, exchanging numbers, this is the way of the Torah. Who sponsored this event? That fool. He thinks, I gave to the shul 25,000, what a tzaddik I am. 
לנבי פניש פורט. זה נור מצוות, תראה. נור מצוות. Sometimes a person doesn't make a עבירה. He gives to a worthless cause, but it's not considered a sin. Sometimes it's a sin. If you give to a reform synagogue, oh, 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 what's waiting for you? What's waiting for you? You sponsor a gay marriage. Do you know what's waiting for you in the next world for that? Just for that alone, you'll regret the moment you're born. Sometimes it's not a sin. It's just stupidity. For instance, you donate a Sefer Torah to a very wealthy shul that has already 120 Sifre Torah in their basement. They have a huge basement, tables like this. Torah, 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 Torah. They don't know what to do with that. Every week, Achnasat Sefer Torah. Rabbi, my father died. We, we, the whole family, preparing a very special Sefer Torah. Do you have a good Sefer to give me? Yes, I have a very good Sefer. Filin, mezuzot, best, and the best prices on earth. But what do you need a Sefer Torah for? You'll be surprised. Many people wanted me to get them Sefer Torah. I was able to convince them not to do it. So what for? The synagogue, what do you think? They're going to care about your Sefer Torah? They already, the, the Aron Kodesh is full of Sefer Torah. In every minyan, yut minyan, this minyan, that minyan, more than what they need. It's a headache for the gabai. He has to refresh it once a year. It's a big headache. Responsibility, chas v'shalom, flood, theft. When, who needs the headache? Oh, wow, I never thought of it like this. But most of the people ended up doing it anyway. Even though they understood 100% that no one will touch their Sefer Torah even five minutes a year. It's mamash, like burning $100,000 with a party. No one will touch it. But they still did it. Why? A show off. There's no other explanation. I heard somewhere that everyone's supposed to have a Sefer Torah. In the old days. In the old days there was no print. So people had to write their own books. <laughs> How are you going to have Chumash? So if you can afford it, and you know how to write, you write yourself a Sefer Torah. So it doesn't apply now? No, today you buy $20, you get a beautiful, I don't know, $50 with English translation. <laughs> how much Sidur cost? $10, $20? Today, you don't need. It's also a problem. If you want to have Sefer Torah in your house, do you know how many halachot you have? What to do in this room? Modesty issues, this, that. It's, it's become like a synagogue. Put it in the room, you close it. You are now like in the middle of a shul. You're inside a shul now. It became a shul. You have Sefer Torah in the room. So, okay, he doesn't get, he doesn't get punished for that. After all, he, he made Sefer Torah. But it doesn't give him credit. $100,000 went down the drain. I, if I had a synagogue like this and people would tell me, Rabbi, we want to make Sefer Torah, we want... I said, don't bring it here. We have enough. I don't want it here. Find a place that don't have Sefer Torah. To give another Sefer Torah to a place that have more than a hundred Sefer Torah? You understand the point or no? You have a homeless here on the street and next to him uh, Bill Gates. And you want to give a hundred dollars to one of them to help him out. Who are you going to give it? To the homeless or to Bill Gates? If you give it to Bill Gates, people would know that you're a very dumb person, right? Why you give Bill Gates a hundred dollars to help him to buy falafel? Ma? He already have billions. Why are you giving him another hundred? Give it to the one who doesn't have any. Right or wrong? Why you give it to a place that already have more than a hundred Sifre Torah? Give it to a place who just open up. They don't even have one. Oh, at least they're going to use it at least three, four times a week. You get the point or no? Yep. So going back to what I started with. So we went to Egypt. There was the source of the exiles. Yaakov, is, he loves Yosef because in his mind, Yosef should have been his Bechor. Then he finds out he died. They come and tell him a story that uh, an animal ate him up. So really now, whose fault it is that we went to Mitzrayim? Whose fault it is? 
I'll give you the candidates. One is Yosef. Second is the brothers. Third is Yaakov. Fourth, Lavan. One of those four, it's his fault that we had to go to Mitzrayim for slavery. Yeah. Who should we blame? Yeah. Now let's see why we should blame Yosef. Yosef was telling Lashon Araba the brothers certain things they did was questionable. He runs to Yaakov to tell. So he, he caused them to be jealous. Yaakov why Yaakov to be blamed? The Gemara say, because of the special clause that Yaakov made to Yosef, we went to Egypt. Clearly in the Gemara. The Gemara say, Ba'avon, this, that Yaakov prepare, preferred one son against the others, that's what caused the jealousy and that's what caused us to go to Egypt. Why should we blame the brother? Needless to say, we know. Why should we blame Lavan? We say in the Agada of Pesach, Bikesh Lavan, Laakor et akol. Lavan wanted to destroy us from the root. Where exactly he did it? Where Lavan wanted to destroy us from the root? Hitler wanted to destroy us from the root. Haman wanted to destroy us from the root. All kinds of other dictators in the past wanted to hurt us and destroy us from the root. The Arabs wants to destroy us from the root. But where Lavan wanted to destroy us from the root? A tiny little scam. Switching Rachel and Leah, causing Yosef not to be the Bechor. But Yaakov, still in his mind, Yosef should have been the Bechor, so he gives him a special treatment. That caused the jealousy from the brothers. Who caused Yosef to end in Egypt? And that's when we ended up in 210 years, which from that about 80 something years was slavery. Not the entire 210 years was slavery. We did not become slave from day one. When Yosef was a leader, we had a wonderful life there. We lived in Goshen, we were wealthy and happy. They treated us like kings. We are the family of the treasurer. Yosef is in charge of all the money in the world. He made Egypt a huge financial empire. Eighty years old, the money in the world was under his signature, his ring. That was his stamp. All the money in the world, never in the history, we had a case like this, that one person controlled all the wealth of the world, one person, for eight years. Even here, the chairman of the... Federal Reserve, you know, what, you know, all these, what's his name now? It's a woman, no? Powell, Powell, sorry, Powell. Powell basically is controlling all the financial in the world. If he raise the interest, it affects the world. If he lower the interest, it affects the world, it affects the market, it affects the mortgages. It can create a disaster. If he will continue to raise the interest rate, let's say now he comes and say, you know what? Now it's going to be 11%. That's it. America is finished. People will kill each other on the street. That will be the end of us. Now, that's why they're now realizing that we have to start lowering the interest soon. Bernanke. Remember Ben Shalom Bernanke? A religious Jew? He was uh, the head. He saved America in 2008. A religious Shomer Shabbos man was in charge of all the money. He realized that this country is about to go down and that will be the end of the financial world. And he started to print tons of money and they forced all the big banks to buy the little ones. And they avoided a disaster here, even though it was a disaster. But he was able to get us out of that mess of 2008, remember? 2008 was almost the end of the world. But no one had the power that Yosef had. Yosef decide who's going to eat, who will, have, who will pay tax, who is the, uh, the exempt from tax, who is going to get food, who is not going to get food. He could have sent the person to jail. He saw the power Yosef had. He took his brother, arrested him, put him in jail. Basically, he's the king of the world. King of the world was Yosef. 
For how many years? 80. What, go, what got him that? 12 years in prison. Innocent man went to prison. Without the prison, he wouldn't save the nation of Israel. So the prison was good or bad? <laughs> That's the saving that we had. Thanks to that, he ended up as a right-hand man of Paro. Without the jail, he would never make it. See how Hashem turned it around? That an innocent man goes to jail. Unlike that Persian man that was innocent, they put him with that monster. He lost all his money, but something good came out of it. What? That he called me to do a lecture in his house, and they became religious. So if the five corrupted cops would not rob that Persian man, probably until today would drive on Shabbat. What made him religious, the whole family? Very possible that, that that tragedy was actually changing them completely. Just like in Israel now. You know how many people became Shomrei Shabbat in the last two months since October 7th? You have no idea. I saw a picture today of boys from the kibbutz putting tefillin for the first time in their life. Like ten of them with their hands like this with the tefillin. They decided to start putting tefillin. Kids from the kibbutzim grew up like goyim. I don't think they even had bar mitzvah, these kids. This is the kind of people that live right on the border of Gaza. Those are the places that the Hamas attacked. Very secular, anti-religious places. There are two religious kibbutzim. Their gate was locked on Shabbat. The Arabs, you have a video, are trying to break the gate, coming back and forth. They cannot enter. Why? The gate is closed on Shabbat. All the people of those two kibbutzim got saved. This is what we sing on Shabbat. Ki yeshmerah Shabbat. El yeshmerani. Shabbat is the source of the blessing. Chazal say, more than the Jewish nation observed the Sabbath, the Sabbath observed the Jewish nation. That's a very good thing. It's a great a guardian. So, Rabotai, we got that point. So, Rachel, uh, Lavan did that trick. And Rachel comes to Hashem and say, all the exile, all the destructions that you decreed on my children, it's continuation to what went in Egypt, right? Because we still owe you some debt, right? But why did we go to Egypt in first place? Because I gave the simanim to my sister Leah. Because I told her the secret, she was able to fool Yaakov. Because she was able to fool Yaakov, Yosef is not the firstborn. If Yosef was the firstborn, there was no reason for anyone to be jealous. And they would never sell Yosef to Egypt. So the reason we went to Egypt is because I did a noble thing. I told my, secret, my sister the secrets not to embarrass her. So we should have not been in Egypt. We went to Egypt for me doing something good. How can we lose from it? That's when Hashem said to her, I don't have to cry anymore. You know, you know that every day has his own tailing, right? That people read. Today they release hostages. They release hostages. All people that read Tehillim today in the world, mainly women, they read the chapters of today. Do you know what was the Tehillim of today? Let me read it to you. For those of you who read, you know what I'm talking about. Lam natseach al machalat maskil le David. Amar naval belibo. A villain say in his heart, meaning thinking, en elokim. There's no God. Ishritu ve'itivu avel eno setov. Everyone is wicked, doing only bad. Commit only bad. Elohim ishamayim ishkif al bnei adam. Hashem is viewing from heaven on people. Lirot to see. Ayesh maskil doresh et elokim. Hashem is searching to see if there is anyone wise 
What makes a person wise? Searching for God. <coughs> Why does it say, Doresh et Elokim and not Doresh et Hashem? Yudke Vavke. Yudke Vavke is mercy. Elokim means judgment. He's looking for din. You should look for mercy. Why is looking for judgment? Smart people look for din, not for mercy. Don't count on mercy. You may get it, you may not. Go by the judgment. You can't go wrong. Prepare for the judgment. Elokim, judgment. I want to see how you run the world. Continue. Kulo sag yachdav ne'elachu. En ose tov, en gam echad. There's now one person who does good. Alo yadu po ale aven ochle ami, achlu lechem Elohim lo karau. All the people that do bad, they eat my nation. When they eat bread, they don't say my name, meaning they don't bench, they don't say Birkat Amazon. Sham pachad u pachad, lo haya pachad, ki elokim pizar atzamot. It's talking about the end of these people, that Hashem will spread their bones. And now comes the punchline. You ready? The last verse in this Mizmor. Mi ten mitzion yeshuot Israel. Who will give salvation to Zion, to the nation of Israel? Beshuv Elohim shvut amo, when Hashem will return his children back. Yagel Yaakov, Ismach Israel. Yaakov will rejoice, and the nation of Israel will be happy. One of the boys that they released today, his name is Yagel Yaakov. Beshuv, Beshuv Hashem et Shvut Tzion, Hashem will return the Jews back to their land, everyone will be happy. Who did Hashem return today? Yaakov Yagel, Yagel Yaakov. On today's Tehillim, will be next week. The chapter is Nun Gimel, 53. Ah, there's not one thing that you don't see it in the Torah. People are blind. Time is running out. Let's move on. Yetzerara. People that are fully devoted to Torah, they're not blind. They see everything crystal clear. See everything clear. People that are not connected to Torah, they're connected to nonsense, they have a lot of klipot on them. You know what klipot means? Impurity. Shells of impurity. It blocks the divine light from their soul. I don't know if you heard my, uh, you listened to my uh, series, Way of Hashem, of the Ramchal, Lutzato. Everybody must listen to this series. If you want to understand the relationship between your soul to God, you have to listen to that series. So one of the problems that all people that commit sins have is that because of every time you commit a sin, a new layer of impurity is blocking the soul from receiving the divine light. When a person repents and starts learning Torah, the Torah removes those layers of impurity. And slowly, slowly, think about it. If between me and you, there is obstacle. One screen, another one, another one, another one. A lot of screens here. When we remove one, now the connection became a little better, right? We can see a little bit light. We remove another one, a little bit more light. The more obstacles we remove, until the huge light comes out. The minute that all the obstacles are falling... That's the moment that a person is already in heaven while he's living in this world. I know a few people like this. Their attachment to Hashem is beyond words. Not here. They're not here. Completely they're not here. They are attached to Hashem like a magnet. Nothing they care about. You can talk about whatever you want. They are, they are, they are in a level of shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid. Hashem is in front of me. There's nothing but Hashem. 
Mikvah is also helping. Mikvah also removes some of this impurity. It's, it's, it's something that makes a person pure. You know, one person came to a Rebbe, if I remember, it was the Kotzke Rebbe, one of the Hasidish Rebbe in the past generation. He said to him, you, the religious people, you have this say, Shiviti Hashem Lenigdi Tamid. Hashem is in front of me always. Do you really believe that it's possible that a person would think about Hashem and see Hashem all day, every second of his life? It's not realistic. So why you write it everywhere? It's a lie. We wish to have Hashem in front of our eyes 10% of the day. It's also very big. We're busy with nonsense all the time. Working, this, that. Why? We have Hashem in front of our eyes every second? <coughs> rabbi, you really believe it's possible? The rabbi say, of course it's possible. Can you show me how? Sure, sure. I'll give you a free demonstration. The rabbi had two big Hasidim, bulvans, you know, big ones. Each one of them is 6'5". Grab that little guy. You're coming with us to the lake. <laughs> the rabbi came to the lake. The first one grabbed his head. The rabbi goes down. Push his head into the water. 10, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. The guy is trying to come out. He needs air. The rabbi say up. The guy is bringing him up, <gasps> down, psh, like this, 10 minutes, up and down, up. And every time he comes up, <gasps> psh, pushing into the water. After 10 minutes, the Rebbe said, okay, the demonstration is finished. <laughs> the guy screaming, what kind of a Rebbe you are? You're trying to kill me. I ask a question. I come down. I show you what does it mean, Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. What's the connection? I'll tell you what's the connection. When you were inside the water, there was only one thing you thought about. You didn't think about your wife, about your beautiful children. You didn't think about your wonderful business, about the checks you have to deposit today, about the sports stupid game you have to participate later today. None of that you thought about. Do you know what you thought about? Air. I need air. That's all you thought about. Air. For us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hashem is air. Can't breathe a second without him. So that's what we think about all day Hashem. I need this. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me with this. Help me with that. So constantly, all the time, I think about Hashem. When I do business, Hashem. When a customer walks into the store, Hashem, thank you. Even if he doesn't buy. Meaning he didn't forget me. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is under control. You know, I told you the story that I have a student that needed help. So he went to the Syrian Gmach. Syrians, they have Gmachim. Gmach means Gmilut uh, Hasadim. They help people that need financial help for tuition. They have different kinds of causes. This one is particularly for, for tuition for yeshivot to help send kids to yeshivot and pay the tuition. The guy needed the money. They made him an appointment with the Gabai of the Gmach, the rabbi that runs it. Many people came, they wait online. <laughs> and this student of mine, this student of mine, listen carefully, he is very innocent with Hashem. Tamim tiem Hashem elokecha is very, very tamim. Everything by him is so... In a way, naive. That's what the Torah said. That's what I do. No question asked. He asked sometimes, is this allowed? Not, not allowed. No, okay, no, not allowed. I, no, I don't do it. Very, you know, pedantic. He has a great minag. He does not speak one word in the synagogue besides the prayers. You can ask him, hey, how are you doing? How's business? How you feel? How's your mother? Nothing. He doesn't talk. He comes to the synagogue, put talit and tefillin, pray, finish, get out. Outside he talks. Even when the prayer is finished, now you come, 2, p 2 p.m. in a synagogue, he's going to sit there learn. Someone comes in, he's not going to talk. Mm -mm -mm, like this. Mm -mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Doesn't say a word. How many people like this you know in the world? This is him. Very strict, this guy. 
So guess what? He went to that gmach, and they told him, you will, you're welcome, go in. He opened the door, he sees it's a shul. The rabbi that takes care of the gmach sits inside the synagogue. That's when he talks to the people. The other people wait outside in the lobby. So he came in, said, huh? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and now he needs money from him desperately. Desperately. Now they told him, this gmach gives maximum $1,000 per person. That's it. If they like you, you get lucky, you get a thousand. If not, they give you less, 180, 101, <laughs> or 18, like this woman, but without pain. 18 with no pain. <laughs> so, so, he's thinking a thousand better than nothing. Well, help me, one man tuition. Talk. <laughs> Now the guy sees this, in his mind, this Syrian rabbi is probably thinking, where is this lunatic came from? Mm, mm, mm. Talk! What do you need? Mm, 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 mm. He said to him, come, come. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Describe to me the whole conversation. The whole conversation is, mm, mm, mm. come outside and I can talk to you. That rabbi started to realize what's going on. He said, what, you don't talk inside the shul? He said, mm. Mm. Not even a word. Mm. <laughs> Write down your information. We'll send you something. How much he sent him? Four thousand dollars. The highest ever. The person that told you, I, I never saw ever that they gave more than a thousand. You know how many people come there? Thousand, thousand, thousand. A lot of money. I think that rabbi was clever enough to see that not every day such a tzaddik comes into your room. How many people like this you have in the world? Don't say one word in a shul unless it's davening. Prayers. You know how difficult it is? Especially if you're a public figure, every second someone comes to you. I saw your lecture. What this? When is your next lecture? What is this? Can you do Leilu Nishmat? Can you do for my father? Can you do? What are you going to do? Mm, 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 mm. It's not possible. So Rabotai, Lavan says, I can't give you the younger before I give you the older. Come on. I mean, she has to get married first. So why didn't you say so when we made a deal? You should have said, work, but first you have to get married. Of course we won't say. Deceiving. Let you believe that you get Rachel. Now he comes with an excuse. Ah, oh, what, you expected me to give you the young one before the old one? By the way, is this permitted or no? If you have a few daughters, and the oldest one is not getting married, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, next one is 22, and the next one is 20, they already want to get married, the girls. Are they supposed to sit and wait until the oldest will get married or no? Huh? If you want to follow the ideology of Lavan, then yes. If you want to follow the ideology of Hashem, then you don't make one suffer because of the other. What has v'shalom happen if Hashem wants the oldest to get married at 30? That's when her shiduch will happen. So now five other girls behind her, they're all going to suffer because of that? That's not what Hashem wants. Everyone gets its shiduch in the right time. When Hashem decides, that's when it's supposed to happen. Not letting them go out on a date, you're preventing Hashem from fulfilling His plan. The same thing when you don't let your children marry, I mean, go on a date with someone that you didn't want. (laughs) One woman said, that uh, she knows a person that says, I want all my children to marry. Everyone is welcome except this Eda. There's one nationality, another one. Do not offer us any shidduch from this Eda. And what happened in the end? All four of his children married that Eda. <laughs> now there are few possibilities here. Maybe Hashem punished him. On purpose you're going to get what you don't want. It's very unlikely. Hashem is not a child in in kindergarten. 
Uh, you say that, a dafka will do it for you. Uh, that's people. But the Satan, remember, he tried to prevent everything good. So when the Satan sees that all four Shiduchim are supposed to be from that Edah, what does it put in the mind of the father to become a racist against that Edah? One person from that Edah come and abused him, disrespected him. Now he hates everyone from this Edah. Why are you hating him? Oh, you know what they did to me? Why? One person did it to you. Why everybody else has to suffer? Because he's a fool. Racism is permitted in the Torah. It's a huge avon. What bird should have been very kosher, but Hashem disqualified the, the kashrut of that bird because the bird is a racist? You see, the Hasidim knows. Hasida. <laughs> Hasida. Hasida. Hasid means extra righteous, very kind. Hasid? Wow, Hasidut, Midat Hasidut. So Hasida, Hasida doesn't murder anyone for living. Eat fish, eat other things, but not killing any other things, you know, like, like eagle, orcs, all this. They are very bad, they're very cruel when they eat. The Hasida is not like that. So why the Hasida is not kosher? Should have been kosher, because the Hasida is very kind only to her own kind. Where are you from? Ah, we're brothers. Come, come. You're welcome. Where are you from? I'm from that country. Okay, we'll get back to you. <laughs> that reminds me of a very funny story. There was one Moroccan guy named Lankri. Lankri is a common Moroccan name. Lankri wanted to put his kids in an Ashkenazi yeshiva in Bnei Brak. Very strict Litvish yeshiva. They like to accept Litvish, Litvish kids from Litvish family. They're not crazy about Sfaradim, and they're not crazy about Hasidim, and they're not crazy about Temanim. What do they want? Their own kind. Like the Hasidah. That guy is a Baal Tshuva, Ben Torah. He learns in yeshiva for a few years. Serious, very serious. You know, black hat, this, Bnei Brak style. He calls the yeshiva to put his child in there. They tell him there's no room. They heard the last name. So I'm sorry, we fool. He decided to let his Ashkenazi friend to call. An hour later, the Ashkenazi called. What's your name? Rosenberg. To come tomorrow 9 a.m. Ah, just an hour ago they say no room. Tom. So what did he decide to do, this Lankri? He decided to change his name to Kellerman. Lankri, Kellerman, same letters. He called a day, he waited a day or two, that they don't remember his, his voice. Ah, Shulem Aleichem, who's Machste? Who's speaking? Rabbi Kellerman. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, no. Who's the Gishem, Rabbi? I have to put my, my son in yeshiva. Oh, you're welcome. Come tomorrow, we'll be happy to meet you. These Moroccans, you know, a lot of Moroccans, they look more Ashkenazi than Ashkenazim. Blue eyes, he has light hair. So he, he looks a real Litvish with his eyes. He came in, Baruch Hashem, you passed the first test. No, well, this, I'm learning in Koilel, very good. Tov, we are honored to accept your boy to yeshiva. The boy went to yeshiva, needless to say, the second boy, the third boy. Now we have three boys already in that yeshiva, and they're very good kids. But now he had a fourth child. And there's a Brit in Bnei Brak. What do you do? You invite everyone. You put a sign in a shul. Everyone is, everyone, sh you don't invite to Brit. Because if someone is invited and doesn't come, it's bad for him. You just announce, there is a Brit tomorrow in this shul and this time. All the Rabbanim, they love these three boys. An important family, Kellerman, such an important family. We have to go pay respect to Rabbi Kellerman. So they all came, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. After the... Brit was performed, 
There's only one problem that he didn't take to consideration, uh, the Rabbi Kellerman. His Moroccan grandmother. Once she heard that they cut, she said, Kula, la, 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 Only Ashkenazim? Ma? What's this? <laughs> it's a mistake. <laughs> Something went wrong with the tape. <laughs> so they found out he tricked them all this time. The question is, who was more embarrassed, him or them? Who should have been more embarrassed? But who was really embarrassed? Him. How do I know about the story? Someone that was there told me the story about the Kululu, and he saw the shock of the, rab- the rabbis. What's going on? It's very sad that among different groups of Jews, all people, all people are not innocent when it comes to racism. People like only their own kind. Like other Jews is second degree. And this is something Hashem hates very much. You have to judge a person by his performance. Tzaddik or Rasha. Good, kind person, honest, good midot, great behavior. Ben Torah, I admire you. Rasha Merusha, I despite you. I want to be near you. So Lamod Arba Amot men and Disreshaim. Regardless of what nationality is, who cares what color is his skin, dark or light, or, he, or his last name or the or the fish he eats. If it's this color or that color, this is only by dumb people. But the problem is that almost everyone in the world is dumb. Jews and Goyim. Almost everyone is a racist. Look what's happening out there. Everybody fights everyone. You know, the one guy told me today, he doesn't know the world is only 6,000 years old. He thinks the world is billions of years old. So the guy said to me, you know, God made the world. And the world was flourishing beautifully for billions of years. There were dinosaurs, there were all kinds of things. Until people came to the world. From the minute they came to the world, they destroyed every good thing about it. The goal of the conversation is, meaning animals, in the end, everyone knows their share, their, their job in the world. But people disagree to live with each other. Do you know a day, from day one, Hashem made the world that there was no war between people? Dispute over land, dispute over... In, South, uh, in Central America, they had a war between two countries over a soccer game. Soccer game. One kicked a piece of leather into the net, and the other country started a war, and they started to kill each other. Do you understand what's happening here? Why people go to a war over a stupid soccer game? What's the cause of the war? How all of a sudden are you well, you're willing to murder thousands of people from the other country just because they won the game? Pride. Pride. All the sport competitions were made for proud people. Someone that is very humble, the last thing he cares about is sport. There's no challenge. It doesn't give me pleasure to humiliate the opponent. People that have this desire to put down the enemy, the opponent, to make them lose, to be the winner, they love sport very much. You see, you see in the basketball court how people fight over a basket, over a foul. Sometimes they become really violent. Violent, can stab each other over some stupid call, foul, not foul. My fault, not my fault. Stupid. I want to finish.
Yaakov now decided after 20 years finished, it's time to run. He doesn't want him to know. Quickly, they ran, they escaped. Baruch Hashem, Leah and, Rif, and, uh, and Rachel are 100% with him in the same decision. And uh, he doesn't want to tell Lavan that he's escaping because Lavan would not let him leave. He would find excuses, hold the kids, leave the kids here, why are you leaving us? So we have to escape. Who wants to say, I'm running away from, uh, from prison? Hey, tomorrow morning I'm planning to escape. Everyone that escape is obviously doesn't want the ruler to find out. So we understand that part. When Yaakov arrived to Haran for the first time, he, did he tell Lavan that he's running away for his life from his brother Esav, that he's planning to murder him? Hi, Uncle Lavan, how are you? Vuzmachste. Alice Git, very good. I uh, came to have a shelter here. Help me out. Hide me. Why, Esav, with 400 Hamas terrorists, is searching for me. <laughs> what would Lavan say? Why you came to me? You want to get me into trouble? Why you came here? Let me give you water and some bread. I will do me Shabarach for you. I'll read Tehillim for you. But why are you coming to jeopardize me and my children? Right or wrong? Your best friends can turn their back to you in a second, in a time of trouble. What's in it for me? Nothing. So I don't need to help you. To begin with, I was helping you because you would cut me a coupon. But now there's nothing you can contribute to me. What do I need you? I'll find an excuse to get rid of you. He didn't tell him his escape from Esav. If Lavan would know it, he would never agree to give him his daughters to be their wi his wives. He would say, what, you want my daughters to be killed? You want my grandchildren to be attacked? <laughs> Lavan would say to him, if you want to leave me, you want to go back, don't you know Esav is still waiting for you to kill you? You have to stay here forever. If later he will find out, he would find that as an excuse. I'm afraid that my grandchildren are not safe. I cannot let you go. You keep the grandchildren here and then you go. But you cannot take them. So, Rabotai, 20 years, did Yaakov ever had chutzpah towards Lavan? Did he ever attack him? Did he ever disrespect him? Did he ever try to take what he deserved to take? It was very down to earth. It's all from Hashem. Whatever I deserve, it's mine. What's not mine, it's not mine. Now when he finally escaped and Lavan chased him, Yaakov take it all out on Lavan. What's the reason? 20 years he abused you every day, took advantage on you, Tricked you more than hundred tricks, the Ari Kadose. One time, five hundred years ago, Ari Kadosh was sitting in a synagogue, and the Al Sheikh, Al Sheikh Kadosh, was giving a speech, and in that speech, he named one hundred tricks that Lavan tricked Yaakov. Not only with Leah and Rachel and the sheep and all that, there are many, many different tricks. So, Ari Kadosh started to laugh in the middle of the speech. <laughs> He's laughing and he looks up. So, to him, Rabbi, you know, he was like a Navi, like a prophet. He had always Ruach HaKodesh, the Ari Rabbi, Rabbi, may we ask why you laugh? He said, I see the spirit of Lavan right above your head. So, every time you say the trick that he tricked Yaakov, he nodded with his head. But what you just say now, he said, no, that one is not true. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> that one of the things that you say in the list is incorrect. <laughs> Meaning 99 of the tricks, he admitted. You know, we have a rule. If someone admits some of the guilt, 
you have to make him swear. מגלגלים עליו שבועה. מודה במקצת. If Ruven say to Shimon, you owe me a thousand dollars. Shimon say, לא היו דברים מעולם. I don't know you, you never gave me anything, you're crazy, goodbye. Can you force Shimon to swear that he doesn't have the thousand? No. But if Shimon say, no, I gave you back 200, why you say 1,000? I only owe you 800. Now you say, oh, since you admit some of the guilt, that means there was some interaction. Come and swear. But if he denies the whole thing, he doesn't swear. What happens if he denies the whole thing and he's a crook, he's a liar, he's a thief? Hashem is going to take care of him. Leave something to Hashem. I don't have to be so worried. Hashem will always do justice in the end. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu is warning Lavan, be careful not to say a word to Yaakov. Not bad and not good. Why not good? I'm warning you, don't mess with Yaakov. He's chasing Yaakov. Why Hashem said to Lavan, don't say anything good, don't say anything bad. Don't say anything bad, we understand. Hashem wants to protect Yaakov as he promised him. But why he said to Lavan, don't say anything good to Yaakov? <laughs> why? The answer, every good thing that come out of the mouth of a wicked person is bad. Can only bring you bad. Because Lavan and Betuel blessed Rivka, that you should become thousands, you should multiply, alafim, or vava. Hashem made her barren for 20 years. She was 12 when she married Yitzchak, he was 40. Yitzchak had Yaakov and Esav when he was 60. 60, that means 20 years they were barren. So when, how old was Rivka when Yaakov and Lavan were born? 32. 32 years old. So that's what the Gaon Mivilna says. 32. She was 12 when she got married. So 20 years she didn't have kids. In the end she had twins without IVF. Without all these holy organizations who help couples that cannot have kids, help them with the treatments. In Israel, here. So, Rabotai, don't say good. Your good is also a curse. Why? Because Hashem doesn't care what comes from the mouth so much, like what's in the mind at the time when you say it. Oh, you have such a nice car. You deserve it. You deserve it. Finally, your husband got you a gift. And in her mind, oh, I wish the car will go on fire any minute. Why would you have it and I don't have? That's what she thinks. But she put a show. Mazel tov. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Oh, chamsa, chamsa. So hard today. Some people are so afraid of Ainara, they don't sleep at night. <laughs> Over the years, I had secular people coming to me. Rabbi, can the Gemara say, 99 dies out of Ayin Ara and one natural death. But that's only people that believes in Ayin Ara. Someone that says, I don't believe in it, I believe only in Hashem, nothing can happen to him. I once thought that only if you're from the family of Yosef, you have the special protection, Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Aleayin. But then I saw it's not the case. Anyone who say, I don't believe in Ainara, Ainara cannot touch him. Stop going to the Babot. Because of them, problems come. Don't go to anyone. But anyway, so sometimes secular people come to me, Rabbi, I need to meet with you. Okay, come to the lecture in Queens tomorrow, I'll talk to you after the lecture. I see a guy or a girl, completely not religious, shaking. Rabbi, someone made kishuf on me. I, I, you don't know, I found air in a, on the corner in my house. Then I found a doll with a hole. I'm telling you, it's voodoo. My mother-in-law, you know, she has this witch. She never liked me from day one. 
they give me the whole nonsense story, and in the end I ask them, tell me, excuse me, are you Shomer Shabbat? No. You eat kosher? No. You dress madness? No. You pray every day? No. You put filin? No. You play with nuclear bomb that is about to explode in your face any second and you worry about some bullet of an old gun that may shoot one day? What <laughs> You're talking to me about Ainara. Every second you are alive is a miracle. Chalel Shabbat mot yumad v'nichreta anefesh ha'im ha'amea. It's written 12 times in the book of God. So the fact that you're still alive, it's a huge miracle. Doesn't mean you're not going to have to pay for all your Chilulei Shabbat. But for the time being, Hashem is extremely patient with you. And you come to worry about Ayn Arad. You know what it's like? A person has a business that makes 10 million dollars a year. And then he has another boot that made a thousand dollars profit a year. The business that is $10 million a year is about to be shot by the government. The government is about to pass the law. That's it. No business. And the boot is struggling a little bit. So he comes to the rabbi. Rabbi, wow, pray for my boot. I'm about to lose $1,000 maybe. <laughs> you have a much bigger problem. You have a Shabbat. You worry about Ayn who makes these people act so dumb? The Satan. The Satan knows that people always have regret in their life. Rishayim melim charato, the Gemara say. So he makes the primary secondary and the secondary primary. Ikar becomes tafel, tafel becomes ikar. Do you understand what I'm saying or no? <clears throat> Things that are not so important, they are very much into it. Things that are extremely important. I once went to some place. They had the five commandments. Who is allowed to be shliach tzibur? Chazan, who is allowed to pray? First, you have to ask permission from the gabai. Perfectly makes sense. It's not the, the Wild West. Everyone comes and begins to pray. Comes to the Gabbai, who are you? What? Uh, yeah, I'm learning here in this yeshiva. Okay, you can be Chazan. You have your side, he doesn't have, so he will let you go first. Okay, Chazan. The Gabbai is organizing. Then there are four more commandments. Let's read them together. One, you must have a gartel. This string on the stomach, even though he's wearing a belt, but he has to pull it. Okay, that's very nice. It's custom. He must wear a black hat when he pray. That's also custom. He must pray only if he was in a mikveh today. That's also custom. And he must pray with Hasidish accent. Meaning, five, there are five commandments. One of them is necessary, meaning you have to have order in a place. It cannot be anarchy over there. The other four, it's privilege, it's extra. It's not an obligation. By the halacha, it's not an obligation. Yes, they look very, very highly on those things, no problem, but in Shulchan Aruch, it doesn't say that if you didn't go to the mikveh, you're not allowed to pray today. And it doesn't say that if you don't have the gartel, you're not allowed to pray, because today, Baruch Hashem, we have belt, and the pants anyway is tight. The idea of the gartel is to separate, because people used to wear dresses, men. The private parts and the heart are in vision to each other. So they used to put a separation. Tying the, the dress into the belly, it separates the heart from the private parts. Because it's disrespect when you pray in front of God to be not modest under the dress. So once you put that special gartel, you fix the problem. But today, you don't need it. You only do it because it's an old custom. In the old days, because we do not want to change anything, even tiny things. But we have a separation. Everyone has separation. Everyone wears pants as a separation. So, you know, it's not the end of the world. If someone pray without it, Hashem will still accept his prayers. So all the commandments over there are important. Chas v'shalom, I'm not mezalzel. But it's not 
an obligation from the Torah. But you know what it is obligation from the Torah? They should have right over there, if you speak Lashon Ara, please don't ask to be a Chazan here. Lashon Ara is a murder. You, you're murdering the public. If you speak Lashon Ara, Hashem will not accept your prayers. As results of that, all of us are going to suffer. This guy has cancer, he won't be cured because of your Lashon Ara. This one has a trial, he will go to jail because of your Lashon Ara. This one doesn't have a Shiduch 20 years, because of you, another five years he won't have Shiduch. This one has a horrible Parnassah issues, because of you he's going to lose his home. You're not afraid to offer yourself to be a Chazan? You worry about the mikveh? You worry about how long is the beard? You worry about the accent? You worry about the gartel? What about the Shonara that destroyed the life of thousands? And make sure that Hashem will throw you to the garbage, you and your lousy prayers. That's no, not in the Ten Commandments over there. If it was up to me, if I was a Hasid, I would write, Gartel and Mikvah, everything. Chas Shalom, I'm not Mezalzel. But I would write it in the right order. First, are you watching your mouth and your eyes? Because if you're not, if you're in the internet watching things that you're not supposed to, please don't be Chazan. Spare us the, the shame of throwing you out. Don't ask to be Chazan. Some people have dignity. Say, listen, I'm watching things in the internet. I shouldn't be Chazan. Okay, I speak Lashon Hara and listen to Lashon Hara. I shouldn't be Chazan. I would write from the top priority to the last. Did you learn Torah today? You have some holiness in you? If you learn, okay, Vakasha, be Chazan in Mincha. If you don't touch the Gemara, don't touch, don't open a book, already weeks. How much Kedusha you have in you? Now, after I will write the things that is life and death, then I will talk about mikveh and uh, accent and garten. And of course, everything is important. Just because there are certain things that are much more important than others, it doesn't make the others not necessary. Don't get the wrong impression here. Sometimes people say, Rabbi, you said that Mechalel Shabbat is being cut for eternity in the afterlife. So, I might as well kill already. If anyway I don't have a share to the world to come, so maybe let me go and get revenge against the people that hurt me. Smart or stupid? You're going to get an extra punishment, you fool. Just because you have one big punishment waiting, now you're going to add more? You're going to have much more. Just because you do something wrong, horrible, doesn't mean that you're allowed not to do other things. Anyway, I'm a lost case, so I might as well be a thief also. No, 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 that's only fool's things like this. So what should I do? Think how not to be a Mechalel Shabbat. What do I do to change it? Why adding more oil to the fire? Put the fire off. Ah, since there's already a huge fire, Rabbi, I might as well throw some more pieces of wood to make it even bigger. No, you fool. Chalk the fire. Chilun Shabbat is fire. Ba'avon Chilun Shabbat, yesh dleka. Basically, I finished. I just want to read to you one other chayin rambam. And we finish here. The Rambam writes in Ilkhot Shuvat chapter 9, Alakha Aleph. It's a long Alakha. This is what the Rambam writes. After we learn that the reward for all the commandments and the good that we're going to inherit, if we keep and observe all the commandments of God in the Torah, the reward is the next world. That's where the reward will be. Shneemar, as it's written, Leman yetav lach v'arach tayamim. That you should benefit and you should live forever, long. Meaning in the afterlife. And the revenge that Hashem has against the wicked that left the path of justice left the path of the Torah, 
The revenge is the cut, the karet. The karet. That that soul of that weak, wicked Jew is going to be cut from the afterlife. Sheneemar. Hikaret, hikaret, anefeshai, avona ba. That soul will be cut in this life, meaning it's going to die sh- short, shorter than what, his life will be shorter than what he was supposed to lose few years of his life. And it will be cut again from the afterlife. That's what it means. Mot yumat. Mot in this world, yumat in the next world. Ma'u ze shekatuv b'chol ha-Torah kula, im tishmeu, yagi alachem. Ve'im lo tishmeu, ikre etchem. What is it that it's written in the Torah? If you're going to listen to me, you will get it. And if you're not going to listen to me, this is what's going to happen to you. Such as wealth, hunger, war, peace, kingdom, humility, having your land, exile, success, losses, and the rest of the things the Torah discuss. All of that is 100% true. Kol otam advarim emet. Hayu veyu. Everything you saw in the world is based on what we did, Hashem gave us, in this world. And it continued to be forever like this. Once we keep all the commandments of the Torah, yagiu elenu tovot haolam haze kulam. We're going to be blessed already in this world. Peace of mind, good children, parnasa, happiness, good marriage, health. Uvizman shanu ovrim alehem, and when we violate them, tikre otanu araot aktuvot, all these tragedies and curses that are written will happen to us. Ve'afal piken, although the Rambam just explained the reward and punishment in this world as well. Now he will clarify it. Ve'afal piken, although I just explained about the curses and the blessing in this world, en otam atovot en sof matan scharan shel mitzvot. The good that you get in this world is not the actual reward. The real reward is coming in the next world. What you have right now is some crumbs from the cookie. You know, like we go to the deli, they give you an olive or two to taste. Then you buy five pounds. The one olive, it's on the house. Wow, he gave me five olives on the house. I went to Machne Yehuda. Machne Yehuda, there was a Syrian salesman, Halabi, two brothers. <laughs> you never saw in your life such thing. Ha! Ha-ha! Ha-ha! Tfadal, haham, on me, my store is all yours. I said, no, no, I didn't plan to buy all, they have all these things, eh? pies, pomegranate, pineapple, ginger, ginger tea, this one, that one, so, so many things, it smells like paradise. Taste, taste, Psh, give me all things, put, put, make baracha, oh, very good, you like it? Yeah, what about this? Taste, taste, Rebitzen, come here, taste. Tov, okay, give me a little bit of this. He has a spoon, size of a watermelon. I see he sticks the spoon inside the thing. You know, maybe 10 pounds in, on that spoon. Put it in a bag. Don't, I say, how much is this? Don't worry, haham. I told you on the house. Give me this, give me that, give me this. No, you want, no, no, it's enough. No, no, trust me. You won't be able to live without it. Next time you come to Israel, you tell me if it was good or not. Tov, he gave me a few bags. Hacham, this is normally 40-something shekel a kilo. For you, 30-something. Tov, how much? Ooh, almost 700 shekels. What a salesman. <laughs> That's how he does to every customer. How do I know? After I came with the bags... So heavy. <laughs> what am I going to do with all these fruits? Fruits, you put it in the tea, not water. I went to my, uh, to the rabbi that runs my yeshiva in Yerushalayim. It's not nearby Machne Yehuda. A few blocks. We walked in <laughs> with a bag. What is it? His son-in-law asked me. I said, I went to Machne Yehuda. He went to that Halabi. 
Oh, he, he hooked you also. <laughs> wow, this guy, I wish I can take him to my business. He doesn't ask you. Ten pounds. No. Don't worry. But in the beginning, it's very clever. Eat, eat from this. You have to taste this. Tell me, we, we did it by hand. This is my grandmother from, uh, from, from Halab, you know? My, my grand, trust me, my grandmother, she was an expert. <laughs> he fools you, the guy. In the end, you need a mortgage. By the way, this was uh, almost a year ago. I still have <laughs> a lot of his stuff. It's all in the Ziploc bags. Probably when I be 80, I'll be finishing those bags. <laughs> this is what the Rambam say. What you get in this world, the things that they give you up front, eat, eat on the house. Don't worry. That's not the reward. The reward is waiting for the next world. And the Rambam concluded here. And the Rambam says... And the bed that people have in this world, the bed. Problems, flat tire, bankruptcy, this, that, can't find shidur, all kinds of problems. People stole from him, children give him hard time, partner betray him, you know. Terror attack, antisemitism. These are not the bed that the Torah talks about. The bed is waiting for the next world. This is just smacks that a father gives his son for the time being before he cuts him out from the wheel. Gives him smack here and there, hoping he's going to wake up. The smack is not the punishment. It's a wake-up call. And that's what a lot of people don't understand when they get all these punches. They think, okay, Hashem already paid me. I got my punishment. No, my friend, your punishment didn't start yet. Get out of your dream and wake up. Don't say I say it. I'm reading to you the Rambam. Ilchot Shuvah, chapter 9. Halacha Aleph. First halacha. And the Rambam, the Rambam continue. Velo otan araot en sof anekama shenokmim over al kol ha-mitzvot. That's not the revenge that Hashem is preparing for the wicked. Ela kach. Hu etzei ha-advarim. This is how it works. Hashem gave us Torah. This is a tree of life. Everyone who follow it strictly knows that he will inherit life of eternity in the next world. According to how great his good deeds were, according to his wisdom, the wiser he got, the more mitzvot he kept. Hashem says, if you're going to follow my commandments with happiness, with good heart, you will invest in learning Torah and become wise. Hashem commit to remove all the bad obstacles between you and him. From your path. That's the good of this world. Removing the obstacle. That's not a reward. I move away things that are supposed to disturb you. Why? Because I see that you're really anxious to get close to me. Like war, sicknesses, hunger, parnasa issues. We are all the all of a sudden a rich guy say, listen, you continue to learn, don't worry about the rent. It's on me. Where did it come from? From all the people in the world, he likes you? The answer is, Hashem is pleased from the way you are. He found your support. Like good wealth, peace, money, gold, that we don't have to waste time on Parnassah, that you have time to get close to Hashem and learn Torah. We will sit and be clear to learn the wisdom and to keep the commandments. So what is the goal? Life of eternity in the next world. And this is what's written in the Torah. After Hashem promised all the greatness, 
זו וצדקה תהיה לנו. Whatever he does for us over here, we have to look at it like charity, like a free gift. I'm removing the obstacle for, away from your path that you can get closer to me even better. וכן הודיענו בתורה, and Hashem also informed us in the Torah, שאם נעזוב התורה, if we will neglect the Torah, we leave the Torah, we don't learn Torah, נעזוב התורה מדעתנו, the Torah, I don't care about Torah, I care about real estate, I care about business, I care about becoming rich, I want to be doctor, I want to be a lawyer, leave me alone with this. ונעסוק באבלי הזמן, and we will invest our time in the nonsense of the days, שנאמר, וישמן ישורון ויבעט, become father and healthier, wealthier, and you kick the Torah and God from your life, דיין האמת יסיר מן העוזבים כל הטובות שבעולם הזה, שהן חיזקו ידיהם לבעוט, הוא מביא עליהם כל הרעות, השם gives them tons of problems, lawsuits, government, audit, son into drugs, the wife wants to divorce him and take half of his money, the in-laws giving him hard time, the partner is about to break the partnership. These people have not a minute of rest. Who put obstacles in their way? Hashem. You don't search for me, I'm going to retaliate to you, midah keneged midah. You search for me, I'll move things out of your path. You don't care, you want to run to a different path, I'm going to put a lot of obstacles to you. Minds, minefields. הוא שכתוב בתורה, ועבדת את אויביך, you'll be servant of your enemies. The Hamas will make a fool out of you. You'll have to go on your knees, beg them, release ten hostages, please. We, we promise to be quiet for one more day. Give us, give us ten people, please. אשר ישלחנו השם בך, that God sent you all these enemies. Hamas didn't show up by itself. We created them. This is why I wanted to read to you this halacha. תחת אשר לא עבדת את השם אלוקיך בשמחה ובטוב לבב מרוב כל. Because you didn't serve Hashem, your God, with happiness and good heart, although He gave you everything you could imagine. You have too much. Instead of appreciating it, you kicked Him with selfishness and ungratefulness. As results of that, he sent you horrible enemies to torture you. So please, enough. I'm talking to myself right now. You can learn from what I rebuke myself. Enough thinking what we should do in Gaza and what the army should do and the government should do. That's not the point. We're only dealing with the symptoms right now. A good doctor goes to the root of the problem, not just give you painkillers. What's the root of You give antibiotic, it will take off the swelling. What caused the swelling, you Mr. Doctor? Find out the cause. You get out the problem, I don't need antibiotic for the rest of my life. We don't want to find the cause. We don't want to become all Shomrei Shabbat, Bnei Torah, having emuna. We want to count on the army. We want to count on the government of Mechalelei Shabbat, of clowns that eat shrimps and lobsters. We want to count on all kinds of gays, the chairman of the house with his husband. Mr. Chairman. Rabbi sitting in the Knesset. Mr. Chairman, I would like to bring to your attention. Him and his husband, hand with hand, come to the inauguration. This is the way you will behave. You will sell your soul to the devil. The Hamas will rise to such... monster, cruel army with so much power and so much money? Do you know how much money they have? You, know, you have no idea how many billions they get from Qatar, from Iran, from all kinds of Arab countries. They sell drugs, they have all kinds of income. Same thing with Hezbollah, they, they sit on billions. Every one of the leaders of Hamas has five billion dollars and up. I saw the list in Forbes. Mishal, five billion, this one three billion, this one ten billion. They live in Qatar, in palaces. They, they sleep at night in a Four Seasons hotel. It's thousands of dollars a street. Where do they have all this money, all these terrorist morons that don't barely know how to talk? All of a sudden, they became billionaires. The world is standing online to give them money to kill Jews. 
who made the world hate the Jews? Hashem. Hashem wants us to suffer because of the way we behave. If Hashem was very happy from us, now one guy will make a beep that will bow down to you. This is what the Rambam writes here. It's written in the Torah. Parashat Bechukotai, Parashat Kitavo. Nimtza! Conclusion and we're done for today. Perush kol otam abrachot ve'aklalot. The meaning of all these blessings and the curses in the Torah. If you serve Hashem with happiness and you keep His commandments, He sends you blessing for this world to help you to become a more observant tzaddik. And push away the curses from your path. That you have a clear mind to deal with Torah and Torah and Torah. That you should inherit Olam Abba, life of attorney, and you will get the greatness for life of eternity. To a world that is all good and long. <coughs> so what happened? You have both worlds. You enjoy this world and the next eternal world. Lo- lo- wonderful life. Yeshiva, you do a lot of wonderful things, you have a nice home, nice car, nice clothes, good children, they all dress well, you eat well, Baruch Hashem, everything is working. You marry them, you help them, you help them to move into their own places. But that's not the reward! It's millions of dollars over your lifetime. It doesn't count as even 1% of the reward. This is just removing the obstacle from your way. And you should have a mind to deal with Torah and mitzvot. If you deserve it, if you're real, if you do it with happiness, with devotion, not a faker, not some university faker that speaks on YouTube is heresy. No, not this kind of people. This kind of people, the uh, terrible world is waiting for them. If you don't buy wisdom, meaning you don't learn Torah, and you don't do good deeds, what is he going to inherit? Conclusion, Rabotai, a person loses both worlds. He doesn't have this world, and in the end he doesn't have the next world. Look at all these politicians, all these leaders, prime minister. There's not a second that they have a peace of mind. Attacks, reporters, articles, demonstrations. People curse them everywhere they go. No matter how good they are. doesn't matter. You always have crazy people who hate you. And in the end, they don't have a share to the world to come. None of them. None of them. Not Bibi, not Lieberman, not Bennett, none of them. They don't have ulama about all this. What did they gain by becoming politicians? What did they need this for? Ego, pride, control. Control. I have a cousin. He was a very successful lawyer. Not religious. Successful lawyer. Had an office with a partner. Making tons of money. He went crazy to be a judge. Judge doesn't make 5% of what he was making. Judge makes a nice salary, about $10,000 a month. Maybe today, $15,000 a month. Talking to you many years ago. He was making more than $100,000 a month. He's a criminal lawyer. Every case is a lot of money. He gave it all up to be a judge. Why? The people bow down to him. That he decide who goes to jail and who can go home tonight. That feeling of being in control, it's a very big etzerara. Very big etzerara. A smart person should run away from this. What, is, what do we say in Pirkei Avot? Sneet Don't ask for a job as a rabbi. Why you want to be a rabbi? I want to be in charge. I want to be Rosh Yeshiva. What for? What do you need this for? By the way, today everyone who's Rosh Yeshiva, most of the places Rosh Yeshiva is a collector of tzedakah. Do you think he has time to teach there? He has to go make sure they get money to pay to the Avrechim. They can see he has a lot of schuyot. He doesn't have time barely to come. If he comes one hour a day, it's a miracle. All day he has to worry about this and that, the building, that, inspections. Who runs the show? I mean, he gets his respect. Olam Abba is going to get the merit of making other people learn Torah. But he himself, 
unless if he's someone that all his life is Torah, 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 he doesn't care to control, to have his own yeshiva. He just want to learn, that's it. There are people like that. They don't want anything. No politics, no headache, don't talk about me, don't publish me, I don't want people to stand online, to knock on my door, Rabbi, give me bracha, here is a thousand dollar check. There are people like this. You have Ades in a Kotel cries every day, you come to him with an envelope full of cash. He doesn't even open it. He refused to take it. Pray for my daughter. She is 10 years not getting married. Please, Rabbi, I'll pray for her without this. You deserve it if you pray for her. I want you to pray every day, not one time. I'll pray every day. Take it back. That's what I want to take. Why? What do I need it for? <laughs> Eat very little. I learn Torah all day and pray all day. What do I need all this for? Do you know what a gift in life it is not to have money greed? That you don't care at all about money? At all? Nothing, you don't care. Whatever you have, the little you have, you right away find who to give to. Why? You count on Hashem. Whatever I need, He will give me. How many people reach this level? People have billions of dollars and they worry about every penny. Wow. Business went down 5% this year. Stockholders are angry. Instead of 150 million in a quarter, we made 147. Yeah. It's a very concerning phenomena. We have to make an emergency meeting. How we save the stock in the next quarter. That's all they think about. All day. <laughs> I remember one time there was a, bu a, a company of buses when I used to work still in the bank, a representative in my old days. There was a campus travel. Do they still have them, the buses? Huge fancy buses. The guy owned thousands of buses, a Jew. I went to meet him to convince his company, they make me an appointment to convince him to move to my bank. I see a guy almost 100 years old. He said to me, come meet me in the evening in the office in Fifth Avenue. I say to him, you still work every day? What else do I have to do? But everyone left the office. He's there alone. <laughs> While I'm convincing him, I look from the window how they tore my car. I'll never forget this guy. <laughs> Now, Rabotai, this guy back then, 25, 28 years ago, was worth billions of dollars. You see a young Israeli Jew, his car is being towed, it's a few hundred dollars. To go now to West Side to release the car, wouldn't you offer, I'm sorry, you know, you came to meet me, even this, let me cover the tow. You have billions of dollars. <laughs> you have hundreds of hundreds of, each bus worth millions. You know those big fancy buses? Tough luck, young guy. Say, wow, they're just towing my car. It's not your day. <laughs> These Reshaim, they think they take their money to the next world. That's what the Rambam talks about. What's waiting for this kind of people? <laughs> think about it. You have a billion dollars, a young Jew comes, trying to make a living young. 21, 22. What's, what is it for you? <clears throat> Before you write the check, you already made a hundred times more. By the time you finish to fill up the check, three hundred dollars for the top, you're right. Three hundred dollars, you made thirty thousand at that time. What is the greed? You see a bachur yeshiva, you let him pay. You go out to a dinner, and one of the people in the table is bachur yeshiva. You split it equal to all the people. You're not embarrassed of yourself. The bachur yeshiva, poor guy, has all his money in his life is two hundred dollars. Now you're going to have to give uh, 60, 70 dollars to the meal and you sit there with your millions and you, and you let him pay? Everybody has to pay for his meal. Shame on you. You don't deserve to breed someone like you. See, Bachur instead of kissing his feet, you make him embarrass, pay, pay for your own share. What did you order? Collect. Don't worry, you're insulting me. This is what I'm saying here. Remember once I told you the story about the lemonade? Salik, the son of Rav Kahana. No time to tell you the story again. We have to go home tonight. But remember this. 
people and don't understand. If you don't learn, run to serve anyone you know that learns. Anything you can do for him. Anything. You need a suit on me. What do you need? You need transportation. You're going on a date. Can I give you my car? No, no, I'm going to go with the bus. No, no, take a car. It's going to be more comfortable. You drive her back, this. Look for Chachamim to serve them. The Gemara says, someone who fill up the throat of the Chachamim with wine. In the old days, wine was very precious. It was only the rich people could afford it. Hashem fill up his pocket. Everything you do for others, you do for yourself. Don't ever make that mistake thinking I do something for anyone. You never in your life did anything for anyone but yourself. That's what the Torah says. Everything. You help your children, one day they'll take care of you. They'll change your diapers. They won't throw you to the street, even though there's no guarantee today. If you didn't give them Torah education, they'll dump you, you know where. They don't care. Most kids don't care. They put you in some fancy old age place, and you hear them playing piano. What am I doing here? My children have no time for me. People that grew up with tradition, they're going to throw their parents to their old age. They'll hire a nurse. She's going to be in the house, take care of them. Everyone will go around the grandma. That's the secret of the wealth of the Syrians and the Persians. Somebody asked you why these two communities are so blessed financially. They're all very good, successful in business. The reason is that they never turn their back on their parents, ever. As annoying as they may be when they get old, they will take care of them like they're taking care of, I don't know who, the king. They never, I never heard in, in my life someone throw his parents, Persian or Syrian, in some uh, place, yalla, nursing home. There's no such thing. They fight where the grandma will be for Shabbat. You be by us, you be by us, you be by... That's the blessing. It's a blessing in life. Among other good things, the car and other things also bring wealth. But in the end, what you do, that's what you get. You plant seeds in the ground, Zoreats Dakot, Matzmiach Yeshuot. There's a verse. You planting Tzedaka, that's the seed. What grows? Salvations to you, to your children. It says a verse in Tehilim. Zorea Tzedakot, Matzmiach Yeshuot. This is what we should call this lecture. Zorea Tzedakot, Matzmiach Yeshuot. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia.